Well, good morning, everyone. This is Billy Trout with the Tennessee Department of Revenue's Taxpayer Education Division. And on behalf of our commissioner, David Gerigino, and our staff in Taxpayer Services, we want to welcome you to today's presentation of our new business workshop. So we're glad to have you on board today. Um, grateful and glad to have our two uh, co-presenters here with us today, Ms. Uh, Liz Garcia, a manager in Taxpayer Services, and uh, we welcome Liz today, as well as the infamous Katie Julian in Taxpayer Education, uh, who seems to be the mistress of all things webinar. So uh, again, uh, we'll tap her on the shoulder, and uh, we're glad to have you with us today too, Katie. And we have Dan Vinson, our Assistant Director in Taxpayer Services online as well. Uh, we'll be monitoring questions that we have at different times that you guys have as we make this presentation. But uh, we want to welcome you and thank you for uh, taking your time to be with us today so we can help you uh, with anything related to having a new business. You know, it's a big adventure and venture when you actually uh, start out uh, trying to do this. So getting your taxes right up front, your state taxes, uh, we can really help you get off on that right foot. So um, we hope the information we have today uh, is, is very beneficial. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Katie for some introductory things. And uh, we'll be talking through you, uh, talking to you throughout the morning. Thank you very much. Thanks, Billy and Liz. Very excited to have you with us this quarterly new business workshop. Um, Liz has great insight. Yeah, it's exciting. She has great insight into this because she's the manager over um, our office locations in Jackson, Memphis, and Nashville, and works with taxpayers all day with this kind of stuff. So it's great to have you. Uh, just a few things that I want to discuss before handing the reins over to Liz to get things started for us. We do have a PDF of this presentation that will have the live hyperlinks you can click you see hyperlinks on your screen here on the webex screen but you can't click them so that pdf will have links that you can actually click uh, there's a link in the chat over there we will be having a recording of today's workshop that'll be on our new business workshop web web page probably tomorrow um, and we are going to be taking a short break about halfway through the scroll forward here um, the today's workshop is segmented into three parts, basically kind of steps to getting set up the preliminary stuff, making sure you've got everything set up right. If you haven't started yet, and if you have already started and Liz brings something up that you think, ooh, maybe I didn't do that right. It's not too late. We can still work with you, but it's just kind of getting all the groundwork laid. Part two is going to be talking about the state level tax accounts, the, the mainly focusing on the big ones, business tax, sales tax and F&E and touching on some other stuff. Um, and then there's going to be a third part where we're going to talk about all the different resources that we have and 10 taps. So we'll probably take the break some just right around the natural midway point, but we will be opening up our chat for you guys to put questions in at the end of each of these three segments. So we'll kind of have three Q&A portions about each thing that we're talking about. So with that, Liz, let me pass over the presenter torch to you here. And I'll let you. While, while you're doing that, Katie, um, let me just um, say one thing. Uh, I, I'm seeing like almost 200 people here. And I'm seeing, uh, let's see, one, two, three people, four people, if you count Dan, and I'm monitoring as well. So guess what? You guys have us outnumbered. So if we start chat and we get a little crazy and we can't get to every one of your questions, we're going to apologize up front. We'll do the very best that we can to address all your issues, like Katie said, as we go through this. But we're also going to be telling you later on, if you have unanswered questions, how you can get specific answers to your questions. OK, so I just wanted to let you guys know that. Thanks. Thanks, Billy. Awesome, guys. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm super excited to um, go over this with you. Um, like Katie mentioned, I am in the walk-in offices, right? So we see and deal with taxpayers all the time coming in and, you know, maybe just don't have that information that they need to get started, or maybe they've already started and just, just need a little bit more. Um, so one of the key words you're going to hear a lot, especially while I'm talking and throughout this entire presentation is resources. 
Um, so that's the key keyword. So if I say it too much, I'm sorry, I apologize right now. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so the first slide you guys see here is our actual for new businesses page. So once again, it's a resource and I'm gonna drop the actual link into the chat box. So if you wanna click on that link and kind of look and open it up while I'm chatting about it, um, you see at the very top, that's a checklist link and that's within the page. So if you click into the page that I just put in the chat box, that very first link is a checklist. So it's gonna tell you the steps and all the items that you need to go ahead and get started, right? So one of the things I see all the time, taxpayers walk in and they're, they have an idea, they have a, a business plan and they're just up and running, but sometimes they may forget a thing or two. So that's where the checklist comes in handy. So there it has steps for registering your business, setting it up, right? So that's step one, very most important part. Um, it has information on getting your licenses and permits. So this snippet that you see on the PowerPoint, once again, it's from our actual website. And if you click into any of the boxes, you'll get a lot more in-depth information um, once you click inside of them. So whatever step you're at, if you're in step one or you're at step four, um, go ahead and visit that link and obtain that information. So step three, establishing your tax accounts. Depending on your business, you may need something that maybe another business doesn't have. So whatever tax accounts you need for your business, you need to make sure that you have those together. That way it can prepare you for the long run in filing those returns. Step four, exemptions. What is an exemption? Do you qualify? Does your business need one? Um, lots of information on which types of exemptions within that little category. Step five, registering your um, tax accounts. You may have established which ones you need, but registering them is a whole different thing that you'll do on Tintap if you're familiar with that, or if you're not, we're still gonna go over that here in the PowerPoint later. And then tax filing due dates. If you have all your accounts and you have everything and you filed, that's great, but sometimes people file after their due date because they weren't aware or maybe you forgot. So those are key points that you need to remember and make sure you're on top of also. So that's the first thing I highly encourage you guys look at that, you look into it, um, and you make sure that you have all the steps in order to go ahead and proceed with your business. Um, so that is that one. We're gonna go ahead and move forward. All right. So setting up a business and determining all these key factors, right? So these bullet points, I'm just gonna kind of go through. Like Katie and Billy said, there may be some stuff you have questions about right at this moment, but just give us a minute, we'll get to it. I promise you we have tons of information for you. And then at the end or when we open that Q&A, look at those notes that you have taken down. And then if there is something that we maybe did not touch on, then go ahead and ask that question because we have a lot of stuff for you. So if you look over to the right side of the PowerPoint presentation, kind of like I said already, make sure you know what you're getting yourself into and what accounts you may need or licenses, not only from us, but from different departments and agencies. So you wanna make sure maybe use that checklist or start another document so that you have everything in order to start from this point forward. We want to make sure you know your business structure and the entity type. How do you want your business ran? We're gonna go into that here in a few. What is your business name gonna be? Where is it gonna be located? You need to know and have a business name and the addresses associated with it. Do you need to register with Secretary of State? We're definitely gonna talk about that. Do you need an EIN or a FEIN? What is it? Maybe you guys don't know. We'll talk about it. When is the start date of your business? This is gonna be very important too and also impactful. So stay tuned and we'll chat about that. What is your NAICS code? I know some of you are like, what? what is that? It's a very lengthy word that we'll cover here shortly. What is your fiscal tax year? That's gonna be important also. And then who are your directors, who are your officers, and who are your stakeholders? Excuse me, shareholders. And um, so those are key, key, key in determining um, those for your businesses. Because if you can't file and pay properly, because you don't have the correct tax accounts or stuff is not set up, um, you need to make sure that we do have those in order. And if not, and if something happens or changes are made, we're always here to help you. But these are the very, very basics. Um, so we just want to make sure everybody's kind of 
up to par with all those and has everything in order. So the next slide is your structure and entity type. So these next couple of um, slides that we have for you basically just goes back to that checklist and um, the slide that we were just on. So what is your structure type? What is your entity? The column on the left is your entity type. So are you going to run your business as a sole proprietor? So that means it's just going to be you and your business alone. It's going to be set up under your social. Simple as that. For example, I wanted to open a bakery. It'd be Liz's bakery under my social. Done. Easy peasy, right? Once you start getting into partnerships, that's kind of what it sounds like, right? It's generally two or more persons. Then that would be under the EIN or FEIN, Federal Employer Identification Number. Um, an LLC, which is a limited liability company. Those can be multi-member limited liability companies also. Those who need an FEIN. Um, the only difference with SMLLCs, which is a single member LLCs, there's been a slight change with that. You can now register um, those using your social. So if you, um, I'm going to take a step back. If you go and you register on Tintap and maybe you come across an error or an issue, um, feel free to reach out to us. We're still kind of working around with that. So it may be something that we need to do on our end or adjust a thing or two, but other than that, should be easy peasy on Tintap if that's how you choose to register your business. Um, professional Limited Liability Company, which is PLLC. So these are going to be companies that are engaged in, like it says, professional services. So what does that mean? Um, doctor, attorney, accountant. If you feel as though this is kind of what your business structure is leaning towards, then that would be your option or excuse me, your choice. Once again, uh, FEIN is needed. If you wanted your entity type to be a corporation, that is a chartered legal entity. So this means they have their own rights, they have their own privileges and liabilities. So if you feel as though that's going to be most beneficial for what you're looking to start, then you would choose that option, which would need a FEIN also. And then nonprofits. So um, nonprofits are anything charitable, so Boy Scouts, political, um, churches, religious organizations, that you would um, need to obtain a 501c3 through the IRS, and that is also where you would obtain your EIN. Um, so these are something that you need to think about once again. Um, when we have walk-in taxpayers, the biggest thing that we hear, we see is, well, I want to open a business, um, but I don't know how or what should I have it under. So we can't tell you that. That is something that you as a business owner need to determine prior to even coming to see us. You need to have that in the back of your mind. How do you want your business ran? How do you want it structured? Um, so you need to make that up. Although we can't tell you, we can definitely help you and educate you on the differences. So that's very, very important. Setting up your business name. Business name and addresses are super, super important. Um, it may seem kind of silly. It's fun, right? Because you get to choose your business name. We have tons of resources and, and websites to help you, right? So the two links we have here for you, um, the Small Business Administration website, that helps you. Um, it gives you tips on how to choose your business name. So if you have maybe three or four juggling around in your mind and you can't really narrow it down, look at that website, check out the resources, and maybe that can help you more than you thought it could. Um, and then the Secretary of State's Business Name Availability Database. So this is a helpful resource also because you're able to not only narrow it down, but to see if your business name that you have in the back of your mind or that you have you know, set in stone is already being used within your community or, um, if it's already being chartered. So you want to make sure you don't take anybody else's name or it's the same. You want it to be not in use. Um, so that's a very, very important aspect um, of your business. Addresses. Addresses are super, super, super important, um, especially your location address. And Mr. Billy Trout said something, I think in a previous webinar that stood in the back of my mind and will forever stay in the back of my mind is your location address cannot be a PO box. And as you can see at the bottom, 
it says business locations cannot be a PO box. You cannot conduct business from a little tiny post office box. So if you take anything away from this PowerPoint presentation, take that. Um, it's a very important part of your business. You can't register using a PO box location. Um, so that's very, very important. It needs to be a brick and mortar, preferably. It can be your home address. It's where you're going to keep your books. It's where you're going to keep your records. Um, so that is going to be your location address um, where the revenue is being made, where the revenue is coming from. That is very important. Now, your mailing address, that can be a PO box because you can slide in an envelope <laughs> in one of the little post office boxes. Um, so that can be wherever you receive your mail, wherever you receive your documents. The Tennessee Department of Revenue sends tons of letters, tons of notices. We try to do postcards. We try to make it fun. It's not to scare you. It's not to frighten you. Our letters are intended to be, once again, educational. They have tons of information about your accounts specifically, and they also have um, information about any changes that have been going on within the state. So your mailing address, whether you move, whether you're thinking about moving, um, make sure that's always updated because we won't know that you move <laughs> if you don't tell us. Um, so super, super important. And we'll touch um, base on that a little bit more and how to make changes or how to update when we talk about TINTAP. Um, so it's super easy. Even if you don't have TINTAP right now, you can call us. Um, we can change it in our system or you can mail something in. Katie, what's up? I just wanted to add to that, Liz, about changing your address. Yeah. It would be great if the state of Tennessee and all the different agencies that are included within the state if our systems talk to each other, but it's just not the reality of the times we're living in. So you, if you do have a new address, you might need to contact the Secretary of State and contact us and contact your clerk. Um, just contacting the state at this point in time, we don't have a consolidated system where you update it with one agency and the, all the other agencies know that you've updated your address. So just a note there to make sure you're covering all your bases. Yeah. Um, the um and to piggyback on what you're saying katie too um licensing boards like if you hold a professional license that's another place you need to change your address mm -hmm. too and uh <clears throat> excuse me what liz said earlier is super important we we do not have a crystal ball we do not know if you move only you can tell us okay so it's super important that you always keep that information up to date um, and, and we'll adjust. We'll adjust to whatever we need to for your mailing address, your physical address, you know, whatever it is, we can make these changes, but uh, it's it's very critical that we always know what's going on. Okay, thanks. Yeah, those are, those are great points. And um, to what they both just said, um, another thing that I see in the walk-in offices is, you know, people will come in and say, hey, you know, I need to speak with somebody at the IRS or, uh, is this a secretary of state? No, it's not. So it's, you have to make sure you're going to the right places. There are there are tons um, of different places that you need to go in order to run your business successfully, take out those licenses, take out those permits. Um, so like they said, if you change something with us, make sure that it's updated at every other um, department and building and resource that you need to go to to make sure that you're all on one level, all on one page with everything. Um, so thank you guys for chiming in on that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Secretary of State and IRS. So do you need to register with Secretary of State? If you are any of the things um, listed below, if you're a corporation, a limited partnership, um, in short, yes. So if you're doing business and chartered with the state of Tennessee, go ahead. Hey, Liz, uh, I think we're on the a different slide than you over. Oh, yeah, place. you are. I'm sorry. There you go. Sorry, y'all. Um, so if you are a corporation, a limited partnership or chartered with the state at all, then yes, you would need to register with Secretary of State. Um, and then there is a link on the PowerPoint again that you cannot click, unfortunately, um, but it's to file your annual reports, right? So you need to make sure you're up to par with everything with SOS as well as revenue and anywhere else. Um, so what are annual reports? It's basically just a report that shows um, what your company's operations and financial performance was. So if, if you do fall under that category and you need those, once again, Secretary of State is the place to be. Do you need an EIN from the IRS? So what is an EIN? An EIN is an employer identification number. Um, it's basically 
we have our social security numbers. So your business has an EIN. Um, it's basically a social for your business, if that makes sense. So you'll need it for filing your federal taxes, but we'll also need that um, number for our system for when you register on TINTAP um, and all of those good things. If you have an EIN, and we'll talk about this more here in a second, you'll need that if you have employees, but if it's your business, then it's going to be, once again, that sole P, just your social. So just a little information on that. All right, and then determining your start date. So this is super important also. Um, this is going to be the date that your tax obligations with the state of Tennessee begins. So your start date is super, super important. And if you see the blue box on the bottom, once again, it has that red indicator, super, super important. Um, let's say, for example, you want to open and register for sales tax right today. 10 for 2023. You open that sales tax account because you want to obtain your resale certificate. You want to start making purchases um, tax free to stock your shelves to start your business to get it ready to start selling. A lot of people think, well, I'm not open yet, so I don't have to do anything. That is incorrect. As soon as you open that sales tax account and get your resale certificate, you are liable for taxes. So, once again, if you open it today, sales taxes due 20th of November, you're going to still have to report zero. So you haven't, you haven't made any monies, but you did make those purchases to stock your shelves. You have to say, hey, y'all, I opened my account. I didn't make any monies, hence the zero, um, but I'm still filing to show you I've obtained this tax account. I'm filing this return. And then in a month or two, when I start actually making monies, making sales, then you'll report that gross on that tax return. Um, so that's super important because we have people who, you know, open their tax account and they have a couple months that they're behind on because they didn't think they had to do anything with that. Um, so super, super important. If you come across questions that you may have or you're still not understanding, feel free to reach out to us. That's what we're here for. We just want to make sure that you're, you know what to do and the steps you need to take so that you don't fall too far behind, if that at all. Um, so super, super important. Um, if you've chartered with Secretary of State prior to registering with us, then you will use that effective date of the charter. So when you go to register on TINTAP, if you've already gone to Secretary of State, they will give you a charter or we receive the paperwork that you guys bring into us at the walk-in offices and then we use that date um, on the paperwork to start you to make sure everything and all dates are aligned across the board. There is such a thing as um, a delayed start date. So if you plan on opening your business now, but you're like, oh man, maybe next month for sure. Um, you can register using a delayed start date with Secretary of State, and that is the date that we will use to register you or that you will use once you register on TINTAP. So may not be for everybody, but for those who are kind of thinking or iffy about when your actual start date is going to be, you have that option there. Um, so you can speak with Secretary of State or go with that. What's up, Billy? Hey, Liz, let me mention one thing real quick on that delayed start date. Yeah. Um, this time of year is what gets me thinking about stuff like that. So let's say somebody wants to start, I don't know, like an LLC or something, right? So they're thinking about it and then they've got it and they went ahead and got with the Secretary of State and they said they're going to start an LLC, but they're really not going to get going until 2024, right? Well, that's a great way to actually use a delayed start date to help you out because if you say that you start now here in, you know, October of 23, but you're really not starting till January of 24, um, you're going to owe Tennessee's franchise and excise tax, okay? You're going to be on the hook for at least 100 bucks of tax when you're not actually doing anything. So delaying that uh, start date to the correct start date is a great idea, particularly for bouncing from one tax year to another. So thought I'd point that out real quick. Thanks, Liz. No, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, all of that is super, super important. But once again, do your research, ask questions. There are options that are available to you that you may not know about yet. And that's the whole point of this, right, is to educate you on the options you have available to not make it seem like it's one way and that's it. Um, there's tons out there for y'all and we're going to try our best to provide that. So, 
All right, NAICS fiscal year and owners. So what is the NAICS code? What is your NAICS code? Um, what does NAICS stand for? North American Industry Classification System Code. Super, super long. <laughs> That's why we condense it. Um, but what is this? This basically tells us what your business does. It's a, an important part um, to not only have for when you register, but it's an important part to the state. Um, it lets us know what businesses and what commerce is being done, conducted, um, and it lets you choose, you know, if you type in a keyword on TinTap when you go to register, the closest that corresponds to the business and what you are doing. Um, it lets the legislator know, like I said, what information, what businesses are are open, are being conducted. Um, so we have a link there. Once again, you can type it in and kind of just visit that, take a look around. Um, but a lot of people, when they're on Tintap, they, they try to hit next um, and you can't because you do need to fill out that, that part of your registration. Um, it's a very important part. It's tiny, super small, um, but you do need to let us know what kind of business you are, whether you know, it be a hair salon or if you're um, raising cattle, we need to know. What's up, Billy? Mr. Annoying here. So, no, um, no I, I, we have, you, I'm so glad you brought that up, Liz, because we get that question quite a bit too. It's like, I don't know what code I am. You know, I got to look it up and I'm having a hard time deciding whether sure. it's this or this. Here's what you do. You pick the one that fits you best. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please don't spend monumental amounts of time on this. Um, we, although like Liz says, it is important. We are asked to gather this information. Mm -hmm. Some of it's for statistics uh, so that we can put information and reports together for the Tennessee legislature or for other governmental purposes so we can determine how our economy uh, is operating, et cetera, et cetera. But we want to, you to be accurate, but we also don't want you to stress out about it. Okay, so you'll you'll find something that meets what you're doing on there and just uh, being able to do that by code. Kay, do you have something else too? Well, it's just a little bit of a side note where this really came into play of importance was during COVID when we got federal funds and state funds were a distributed economic relief was distributed to certain industries that were uh, very affected by COVID, the restaurant industry, some other industries. That's how we knew how to distribute that economic, those economic relief funds was by your NAICS code. Yeah. So um, we had people calling and saying, hey, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a restaurant and I haven't gotten my economic relief money. And we'd look in our system and they hadn't registered as a restaurant when they set up their accounts, when they put in their NAICS code. So, I mean, not that we expect another pandemic to hit where that would come into play, but there's just so many ways that it could come in. And so just wanting to touch up. I thought that was a little interesting thing too, how much that NAICS code came into play during that time. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's all the, it's all the little things, right? That add up to the, to the big ones. Um, thanks y'all. Um, all right. Fiscal year end. Um, this is just as important. Um, majority of the time y'all's fiscal year end will be December. That means January through December due on April 15th or around there. Um, following the federal guidelines. Um, so what all, whatever you follow federally is typically what you'll do um, with us. Um, sometimes uh, you may have a seasonal business, um, you may be like a water park, for example, um, that ha may have a fiscal year end a little different. So if you're doing a water park and it closes after or during Labor Day, then your fiscal year end may be September. It's, it's a handful of businesses that have a different fiscal year end. Majority of the time it's December, like I mentioned, um, but that's going to be an important aspect of your business that you'll need to know, make yourself aware of. Um, and so you can run it correctly and file your returns within that correct period. Um, and then the last thing on this PowerPoint slide is identify the directors, officers, and shareholders, right? So when you register as a corporation, you need to make sure that you have these um, people's information. You need their address, their phone number, their social security numbers um, for each officer or shareholder that you may add um, to the registration process. These are gonna be the people that are handling maybe the, the day-to-day stuff and overseeing the business. Um, so that's a very important part also. So making sure you have all that information together and ready to um, input in the system. All right, licenses, permits, and more. So this is quite a bit of information. And once again, um, we may go into 
it a little more in depth as we go on. I know business license, um, Katie's gonna talk about that stuff. Um, but business licenses, those are issued through um, county clerks and city recorders across the state of Tennessee. Um, most of them, um, we have a little bit of a change with our thresholds. So we will go ahead and talk about that here in a minute. Um, charter business registration, that goes through the Secretary of State. That's what we were talking about with the delayed start date. Once you get your charter, um, you'll get that paperwork if you're a partnership, if you're a corporation um, through SOS, which is Secretary of State. Your federal ID number, um, which is your EIN or your FEIN, that is obtained through the IRS. Um, I stated that in the previous slide, but once again, if you are anything other than a sole P or an SMLLC, um, you would need to get that from there. There is a website, it's uh, it? irs.gov. You go there and I can actually, I think I have it here, drop that into the chat box in a second. Um, but you'll just go there, follow their link to obtain one, and then that's how you'll you'll get it. It's kind of immediate as as long as you answer all the questions and you do what you need to. They'll go ahead and um, provide you with that. Unemployment insurance. This is through the Department of Labor and Workforce Development. So any and all businesses with employee um, employees or payroll, you would go on T N Pause. So that's T N. PAWS, which stands for Tennessee Premium and Wage Reporting System. Um, this will give you information and kind of guide you on how to register based on, like I said, payroll um, and stuff like that pertain pertaining to your business. So super, super important if that's what you need to look into. Um, professional licenses. This is going to be through the Department of Commerce and Insurance. Um, so if you are any contractor, cosmetologist, if you're an insurance agent, I know we have professional privilege tax also. If you go to their website, it'll give you a list of all the professions um, licensed by the Department of Commerce and Insurance. So if you fall under that category, make sure you go ahead and familiarize yourself with their website, um, just to make sure you're on the right page. Alcohol license, um, the, I like to tell my taxpayers, make sure you know your ABCs. Um, it's the Tennessee Alcoholic Beverage Commission Board. Um, so if you're opening a restaurant and you're selling liquor, um, you need to make sure that you're registered with the ABC and you're paying any fees to them. If you don't know about the fees, go on their website, um, familiarize yourself with them, give them a call, and then we would set you up with a uh, liquor by the drink account. We have uh, our own unit that specializes in that and tobacco tax and everything. So if you have questions or maybe you're just like, I know this much, but I need a little bit more, feel free to call. Um, if you call our main line, it gives you options of which unit to speak with. Um, you would just choose that one um, or whichever one that you need to kind of ask questions to and about. So once again, resources, call us. We have a log. We have tons of people you can speak with. Our call center is amazing. I don't work for the call center, but I know it's amazing. Um, so go ahead and give us a call. Um, and then tax accounts in general, right? So Tennessee Department of Revenue, that's where you come to obtain them, to register them. Um, we are not the IRS, y'all. We are not Secretary of State. We are not the county clerk. We are state. We are state and the IRS is federal. So huge misconception that always, always happens. And we we tell the difference with a smile because we're human, right? So if you take anything away, take away PO boxes <laughs> and that we are not the IRS. So just make sure you know the difference. And then all I have left is kind of like a recap. Um, just make sure you are deciding on which taxes are applicable to you and your business. Super, super important. And like I said, again, Katie's going to touch base about that here in a little bit. And then make sure that you have access to your accounts on Tintap. So we're going to touch base on that closer to the end of the presentation and then a little bit in the middle. Um, so if you have questions that maybe I didn't answer already, keep those down. And then if I have, scratch them off and let's move forward. Um, I am going to go ahead and hand it over back to Katie. Awesome, thank you. We're gonna take a minute. I just opened up the chat for y'all to be able to send questions to this panel. Again, we're gonna get into specifics, uh, general specifics, is that is that an oxymoron? Uh, here in a few minutes about the tax types and the obligations for business tax, sales tax, F&E. But if you 
um, have any questions about what Liz just went over, all the, the preliminary steps, getting started, getting set up, throw those into the chat right now and we'll spend a couple minutes um, going through some of those and then we'll move along. Let's see here, Billy and Dan and Liz, y'all wanna hop back in and we can answer some chat questions that you see. Yeah, so I'm right here. All right, do we have handouts? Uh, well, yes, we do. Uh, we have handouts posted on our website. I think we already put the link in there, but I'm gonna put it back in there for you guys and I'll work on that. There we go. Give me just a second here to copy that link. And this I see a couple questions the in materials. Here. Uh, some questions about the walk in offices. Yeah, I'm going to refer you over. I'm going to real quick take a short field trip and show you that where our, our regional offices are located. I know that they're open some days and not other days. You'd need to check with so, the So Liz, offices. you talk about this because this is oh, your yeah. ball game, yes, my friend. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just didn't want to, I don't want to be like, hey, do you stop? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, so Dan actually wrote that in the chat. So regional offices are open only on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you don't know already, if you just found out, share, spread the word. Um, because I, my biggest thing is I don't want you guys coming in if you don't have to, right? So resources, resources, resources. Give us a call before you even think about coming in. But we also understand that you want to speak to a person, right? And that's what we're there for. Um, but Chattanooga, Memphis, um, Tuesday, Thursday. The only office that is open uh, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 is Nashville. Um, so very, very important. Please don't drive because on a Monday um, to Memphis, Jackson, Chattanooga, Johnson City, because we are not there. Um, so for that, I apologize, but very, very important information. Yeah, so you, um, Katie, are you going to walk them to the, the place where they can uh, make an appointment request? Yes, so here's our homepage, tn.gov slash revenue. And at the very bottom in the footer, under the about us section it says contact us and then office locations and this is where um, you can see the office locations you can request an appointment that way you're not going to waste time going in there it could be something they can help you with over the phone but uh, at any rate they'll let you know for sure when if, if you if, if you do need to go into the office that process will walk you through that and uh, you can make an appointment with the office closest to you Absolutely. And we would really rather that you get an appointment. And the reason for that, like Katie said, and Liz too, really for that matter, is, hey, you know what? Um, why why not make life easy? Why not just uh, let us give you a call or an email or something and help you out and save your gas money, you know, and time yeah. and effort and all that. Uh, but, you, but we're not saying you cannot come into the office. By, by all means, you can come into the office. But um, we're just trying to be as helpful as we can be there for you. All right. What's some other stuff, guys? I've seen a lot of stuff popping up here. Do sole proprietors have to register as Secretary of State? No, um, they do not. You are just uh, under your social. That's all. Oh, yeah, that's right. Wow, there's a lot of really good questions here, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, there's a question. Uh, I think um, Mr. Smith had, uh, do remote sellers need to register with the Secretary of State? Probably best to ask the Secretary of State what their registration requirements are in that office uh, and, and to reach out to their office to know for sure. We have some very specific uh, tax related sorts of discussions in our tax manuals regarding remote sellers and to whether, as to whether you have nexus or presence in our state. So uh, we, we, we can kind of answer your tax part of that question, but uh, we, I'm more comfortable with Secretary of State answering that question directly because I don't want to step on their toes. Do y'all agree with them? I do. Okay. Um, same with the question about, is a PL, PLLC required if you provide professional services? That's one, that, or is an LLC sufficient? That's where I, I, I don't feel qualified to give right. advice on that. I can tell you how, you're, how, how you would register for taxes, depending on which you choose. Uh, but if you're a professional services, so that's um, Kelly that asked that question. Um, and Kelly, what I would say on that is reach out to a competent CPA, tax attorney, uh, or someone like that, 
to to get some really good advice about that uh, specifics on business structure. What when Liz was going through her presentation, which was excellent on the different types of pre of uh, structures that you have, the one thing that we are not is experts in what it all means. Now, I don't mean that to say anything derogatory to our, our folks, but our job is to register you in the way that you wish to be registered, okay? So uh, here's a great example, and this, this happens all the time, probably every single day. People will say, well, my buddy said I should be an LLC, so I signed up on some website online and got an LLC, and now I, you say, I owe all this money on franchise and excise tax, and uh, I never did anything with the LLC and all this stuff. So th this is a, a giant snowball going down a giant mountain, okay? And it continues to get bigger and bigger until it's addressed. So be very confident in what you're doing. Know that business structure. Know why you're doing what you're doing, okay? If you don't know, ask somebody, okay? Um, Tennessee Small Business Development Centers are excellent. You know, some of the other resources that we've mentioned or will mention later um, can can really help you. But uh, but bottom line is, please know what you're doing before you do it. And like Liz said too, on sales tax, uh, guess what? When you say you're opening your sales tax effective October first, two thousand twenty-three, you are. You know. That means by the 20th of next month in November, you're going to send us a uh, sales tax return on the TinTap system, even if you have no sales, okay? If you don't, we send a nasty gram, <laughs> or I shouldn't probably say that, but <laughs> it's called a notice of proposed assessment. How about that? Or nasty gram, whatever you are talking about, <laughs> I don't care. But anyway, uh, it's it basically, it's saying you would owe a giant amount of money that you don't owe, right? Don't pay it. Don't do it. What you need to do is to file a return, okay? Yeah, yeah if it, even if it's late, there's a small charge, a small penalty, very small interest, things like that, way less, but don't don't get caught in that vortex, okay? And even more importantly, <clears throat> excuse me, if you do get caught in the vortex, do not ignore the vortex, okay? <laughs> when you get 13 letters from us, it's time to call us, okay? When you get yeah, one know. letter, <laughs> you yeah. get one letter. Yes. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, so, I wanted to, I wanted to ahead, touch I'm base sorry. on that. No, you are completely fine. I wanted to touch base on that a little bit, and then it's going to kind of segue into one of the questions I've seen. Um, so once again, in the walk-in offices, we 90% of whoever walks in is showing us a notice, and they're like, I got this letter. I need to make a payment. And I already know, and my team knows in the back of our head, we're like, you, you don't owe thousands of dollars. That is just an estimated amount because you have not filed your return. So no, you don't need to make a payment if you receive that notice, unless you read on there, hey, you know, you did file your sales tax return or your business tax return, and this is the amount you owe because you filed. But if you get a NOPA, like Billy said, the notice of proposed assessment, just know that it's because you need to file. We're saying, hey, hello, you open these accounts, Please file your returns and you would only be liable to pay whatever it is based on those figures that you made for for that month for that year. Um, so super, super important. And 1 of the questions in the chat, um, we're actually going to go talk about this. So we will answer you Juanita. Um, it says, I can't find where I'm supposed to be um, reporting my sales. She just basically has her business tax, but she needs to file sales tax. So we are going to touch on that because if you register with Tintap. Everything is not going to automatically populate. There are a few steps that you have to take in order to make sure that all of your accounts link to that first 10 tap log on homepage. Um, so we are going to talk about that. So don't be scared if you don't know about it right now. You will learn it by the end of this presentation. Yeah, and, and to piggyback on that too, Liz, too. Honestly, guys, as as being as all this stuff is like popcorning you to death, you're feeling like, okay, Katie said this and Liz said this and Billy said this and all that. Relax, okay? Because when you don't understand something, when you get that weird letter, when you just don't know what's going on, all you have to do is pick up the phone, send us an email. If you have to go into a walk-in office, you're welcome to make an appointment. Let's figure that out or whatever, like we discussed before. But reach out. Do, do not ignore the problem. 
because we're there to help you, okay? Um, we take a lot of pride in doing what we do in taxpayer services. Um, I'm, I'm gonna pat ourselves on the back for a second, guys, and say that when we talk to different CPAs that work uh, throughout the nation, um, they're very pleased with our services. When you call us, a human being answers the phone. How about that? Isn't that weird, right? But like Katie and I have joked in other webinars, you call us on April 15th, yeah, you're going to wait for a minute for that human being because it's busy, okay? But besides peak periods and things like that on a regular daily basis, we will answer the phone and we will help you. The person that answers the phone, if they don't know the answer, they'll find somebody that does, okay? that That's the way we do business. We're, we're customer service oriented and we truly only want you to pay the exact amount of tax that you owe. We do not want you to overpay your taxes and I cannot stress that enough. So anyway, now I'm going to stop preaching. How about that? I see a lot of questions in here, y'all, that are that are related to tax accounts and filing dates and all that. I think we're, let's for the sake of time, let's go ahead and move along to start talking about the taxes because we're kind of naturally heading in that direction anyways. I'll turn the chat off during the during the slides and then we'll turn it back on uh, when we come to our next break. And just to just to remind everybody else too, when if we do not get to your question, we apologize up front. Uh, we've got now over 250 people in here. So um, uh, it's not gonna be possible to address everything, but us touching on these different tax types and giving you a couple more windows for chat, uh, we, we hope to be able to circle back and uh, we'll definitely give you an outlet uh, for an email or a phone call to our office so that you can get your question answered specifically. So you're going to get your answer one way or the other is what I'm saying, okay? Thanks. And we're gonna be sharing lots of resources. If you um, have ever been in one of these new business workshops with us before since we've gone remote, since they're virtual, we made some changes this time around to add in links to a lot more of our resources. Of course, as I was saying, you can't follow the link directly from your from your WebEx screen, but that participant guide that we pointed you to, that's a PDF of all of this, you can click directly on those from there. So stressing resources. All right, so we're gonna talk first about business tax. Honestly, uh, VAT and sales tax and F&E are the three biggest tax types that affect most businesses um, a lot fewer businesses are going to be affected by business tax starting uh, it currently because of a, a big law change that happened uh, in our general assembly this year so business tax and business licensing are very closely connected um, they they are they're tied into each other in a lot of ways uh, it's based on your your business tax filing requirement is going to be based on your annual gross sales so not your net sales but what you gross before paying employees, before paying rent, before anything, what are your gross receipts? If you make under 3,000, no business license is required, therefore no business tax is required with no license or tax, there's no renewal involved. So basically, no, if, if you're under three, you're not gonna have a, a business tax or licensing requirement. Now, this is the big change. Um, between 3,000 and 10,000, I mean, I'm sorry, 100, thousand annually that number used to be ten thousand so now a, a new threshold of a hundred thousand is the minimal license threshold between three thousand and a hundred thousand in gross receipts annually you'll need to obtain a minimal business license and with a minimal business license there is no business tax requirement you would just renew that minimal license with directly with your county clerk every year or city clerk, if you if you have a city license, some municipalities or cities throughout the state do have business license. You would just need to check with your jurisdiction to see. And we do have a link on our website that lets you know which um, which cities, which municipalities have business license. Uh, we had a webinar last week that was about this threshold change. So if you're a new business and you got set up with a with a standard license, because at the time this threshold hadn't happened yet. We talk in that webinar about how to handle that situation, so I'll refer you over to our webinar uh, video library to check out that webinar if you think that, that affects you. But anything over 100000 in gross sales annually, you're going to need to obtain a standard business license and therefore a business tax requirement. So if you have a standard business license, 
you'll file business tax, a business tax return every year, and that will renew that business license. We send clearance that you have filed and paid to the county clerks and city clerks, and then they issue that renewed license. So this new threshold, this $100,000 threshold, that under that you need a minimal license and no business tax, over that you need a standard license and will pay business tax. That's based on your total gross sales per jurisdiction. All right, so who is subject to business tax, as I just stated? In-state businesses with gross sales over 100,000. Um, In-state contractors with gross sales over 100,000 sourced to where they're based, their, their base jurisdiction. Also in-state and out-of-state contractors with gross sales over 100,000 in deemed locations, which is a deemed location for a, for a class four contractor. And those are contractors who, who do work to real property. Um, the deemed location is where the job site is. So if you're a contractor that's, let's say you're based out of your, your home in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, but you do jobs, you have jobs in Nashville, you have jobs in Franklin, that would be those, those Nashville and Franklin locations would be your deemed locations. So uh, that's also a slight change with this threshold. Out of state businesses, as Billy mentioned earlier, there are various uh, nexus rules associated with out-of-state businesses for all of our different tax types. We do have a great webinar resource for you that is about specifically nexus for out-of-state businesses. So if you are out-of-state or if you're an accountant or tax professional that works with out-of-state businesses, I'm going to point you over to that webinar. It's, it's again, it's a whole webinar's worth of information. We can't go into all the details here, but Go over to that webinar and check that out if that applies to you or you're, or you're an out-of-state business. Okay, so who is not subject to business tax? In addition to businesses that gross under 100 and have that minimal license, um, casual and isolated sales. If you don't, if you are having a, a yard sale, that's going to be casual and isolated. Now, if you have a yard sale every weekend, that's a little different. Um, as I mentioned, gross receipts under 100,000. You're not going to be, you're going to have that minimal license and uh, no business tax requirement. They estimate with this, with this Tennessee Works Tax Act, which is the law that changed the threshold amongst many other tax law changes, uh, they estimate that this business tax threshold change is going to affect about 140,000 businesses, approximately 140,000 businesses in the state. So it was really huge for small businesses. There are some services that are exempt from business tax. For information about that, we're not going to go into detail here. There's just a handful of them, a lot of professional services, um, such as law, legal services, medical services that are exempt from business tax. For the most part, most every uh, business in Tennessee is going to be subject to business license and then if they fall within that threshold business tax but some entities entities are also excluded from business tax like manufacturers for more information on that there's a link to our business tax manual and some sales are exempt from business tax sales of certain items not very many I'll be honest y'all there, there's just not a lot of exemptions um, so if you if you fall over that hundred thousand in gross receipts um, but wonder if you might be exempt. I'm going to point you over to those to those resources there. Okay, this is a, a lot of information on one slide. This is information that was probably what previously was about 10 slides worth of information, but in an effort to try to squeeze as much into this three hour workshop for new businesses, I've got it all on one page here, along with some links over to resources. So business tax in a nutshell. Gross sales are defined as all sales derived from products or services that are delivered. How do you determine what your gross sales are? Here's a link, page 34 through 44 in our business tax manual for how to determine gross sales. Uh, it's based on uh, business tax is going to be multi gross sales times your rate. Well, how do you determine what that rate is? It's based on what classification you are and whether or not you're a retailer or, or a wholesaler. Um, we have five different classifications, whatever your dominant sales are or services, it, that's going to determine what classification you are. It's very important as we were talking, as Liz was talking earlier about making sure you get set up straight with everyone. You got everything, all your ducks in a row and all your I's dotted and T's crossed. This is something that comes into play when you have, when you're in a jurisdiction 
for obviously you're going to be in a county, but also if you're in a municipality, if your business is located in a municipality, make sure that you are registered with the same classification with both. I saw a chat question too about, you know, how, how's it all, how are you all related, the, the state and tax accounts and the city clerks and the county clerks? Well, you get that license locally from the city or county clerk. Sometimes both, if you're, if you're in a jurisdiction that, that has a city license requirement. But it's just very important that all three of those line up right. We see a lot of business tax account issues. If you, um, I was talking to a customer recently who was set up differently at the city than at the county, and it had, it had actually set them up with two separate locations because our system just thinks they have they must have one business doing this and another business doing that based on classification, right? So we can fix those things. And as Billy and Liz have said, we're going to share our contact information here soon. If you ever have any doubt or any question that making sure you're set up correctly, if you think there might be an issue, just contact us. It's better to stay on the front end of that and deal with it until or before April 15th or whatever your filing deadlines are. Retailer versus wholesaler, figuring out what you are, how to determine whether you're a retailer or wholesaler. That's not something that you determine on the front end when you're registering for business tax. That's something that will be determined and that you'll have to choose when you go to file business tax. And it's just going to depend on what the majority of your sales were. Were they as a wholesaler where you're selling to other re retailers, for example, or mainly retail sales? How to determine that? Again, there's a link in our business tax manual, pages 59 through 63. There are a few deductions and credits that you can take off of the of your tax liability. Deductions reduce the tax liability and credits will offset tax liability. More information on, on deductions and credits on these specific pages in our business tax manual. Um, deductions, an example of a deduction would be sales of products delivered out of state. So uh, someone orders something from your business and you ship it to them and they are out of state. They are, that's called a sale in interstate commerce. Now, if they are from, if you are selling in Chattanooga and someone from Georgia comes into your shop and they walk away from your, from your physical location, even though they're taking it into Georgia, that's not considered a sale in interstate commerce. But I could go on and on about some different uh, Examples of all that, but great examples in our manual there about some other deductions. An example of a credit would be you can take a credit of up to 50% of what you paid to your jurisdiction in tangible personal property taxes. That's a sort that's a that's one of the more common credits that we have. So the tax due date for business tax, the tax due date is the 15th day of the fourth month following your fiscal year end. So what that looks like for a typical business whose fiscal year end is December 31st, the 15th day of the fourth month is going to fall on April 15th, which is a big tax deadline that we all have in our in our minds, right? Now, interestingly, that if you're if you hold a standard business license and therefore are paying business tax, that business license does not actually expire until a month after the tax due date. But uh, if you wait until the date that's on your business license to renew, then you're going to have a little bit of penalty and interest because you have to pay the tax on the uh, the month before your business license expiration date is. More information here about filing the business tax. We have a great webinar that uh, walks you through filing the business tax return and also a help video in our help articles section, which we'll show you when we share resources later that walks you through filing the business tax return as well. And in that, in the webinar, specifically in the webinar, we will walk through a lot of those deductions and credits and how to determine those on the return. So good information about that there. All right, let's see what time it is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug ahead. We'll take a break in about 30 minutes, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and plug through, just charge through some of this sales tax information. Um, hey, Katie. Yes. Do you do you think we ought to maybe talk about a little bit of business tax stuff here first of all before we Let's move do. on? Let's do. Let me open up. The, that's a good idea. Let me open up the yeah, chat. Just because there's okay. a natural break. And okay. um, and I want to say first of all, thank you for doing your presentation. Uh, Katie knows how much I love business tax. It's my favorite right. tax, <laughs> and I'm very facetious. But anyway, um, 
business tax is, of course, uh, part of the state law, and um, as is the licensing part of that. And like Katie mentioned in the presentation, it's super important to remember that the licensing and the tax are tied together for those businesses that are making $100,000 or more under the new law. Um, so we do expect a tax to be paid on the tin tap system for those businesses. Um, when you're under 100,000, and quite a lot of you probably that are in, involved in a new business here are gonna be under that 100,000. So um, like Katie mentioned, if you're between 3,000 and 100,000 annually or expected to be, you know, you want to get that minimal activity business license from that county clerk. Um, and there's that slide right there. Um, and then, of course, if you're located in a city uh, from the city recorder's office as well, the, the fee is $15 for each one. And you'll renew it each year by the expiration date just by going to those offices and getting a new one. Okay, so you don't really have to deal with us at the Department of Revenue as it relates to business tax unless you get over that threshold, that $100,000 threshold. Then you need to reach out to us and let us know we need to make that change for you um, so that we can uh, get you um, started on that end too. Also, something very quick and not to not to beat uh, this to death because this is not really the focus of what we're doing, but for those businesses now that have a standard business license, they already got that issued and you know you're going to be under 100,000, uh, you do want to reach out to us and call us, email us here at the, uh, and Katie's got the information right there on the screen, to let us make the adjustment on your account for you. Um, so that uh, we can get you your status exactly where it needs to be uh, with the, um, you know, 2023 is almost over. Isn't that crazy? It's already October. It's nuts. But but we need to get you set up for 24 so that uh, you can either file and pay or not, you know, and, and that's what we want to do too. We're also going to be sending out letters here in about a month or so to a lot of different businesses that we feel are under that threshold, encouraging them to reach out to us to make this change. And that's all I'm gonna say about that because that's a big bear, that's not why we're here. Uh, but uh, anyway, I just wanna bring it up in case you've already registered, okay? I'm gonna hop back over to this slide again, just cause I see several questions that, are, that lead me back to this. Um, Christy says, for the license, we will need to apply the first time and then after we'll file taxes every year and don't need to do anything else. Again, that de that depends, Christy, on whether you're a minimal or a standard. Standard, you're, if you are, if you are a stand, if you hold a standard business license, correct. You won't, you won't have to go back to your county and city clerk, just, just filing and paying business tax. They'll be the ones to issue it to you. It will come from them. But uh, if you have a minimal license, you will have to go back to the clerk each year at renewal time. Many have online renewal, a lot, a lot don't currently, um, but maybe getting it soon since a lot more businesses will hold minimal business licenses. Um, that leads me to, to my next question, Christy, your next question, can the license be obtained online? Most clerk's office, the major, the majority of county clerk's offices do have online business tax, business license application. Uh, so for minimal or standard cities, you just have to check with the cities uh, individually to see if your city has online. If they don't, you might want to reach out to them and call them and see if uh, they can let you know the process since you're, you state that you're an out of state business. So let's see. I'm talking. What else is going on in here, y'all? In the chat. Just a lot, a lot of people that are wanting to know about today's presentation and how they can get that. I'm going to put this link out here one more time. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, your business, you're an out-of-state business, and you're wanting to know there's a, about the webinar we mentioned. It is the uh, nexus for out-of-state businesses. I'm going to take y'all over real quick, real quick to show you where those are located. Um, so I'm back to. Can you see my web browser, Billy? Yes. Yes. Okay. So tn.gov/revenue. If you go to taxpayer education and outreach, click on that tile. Um, 
this is where you went to register for today's new business workshop, except for you clicked over here on new business workshops. Tax webinars is where you register for our monthly free tax webinars and also can see a library of all of the, um, well, while I'm here, I'll put a little plug in. How about that? Our upcoming webinar, That's uh, these are always on the last Tuesday of the month and it will be on completing the sales tax return. But I'm gonna scroll down here to the webinar video library. This is where you can just put in a little keyword. I'm just gonna type in Nexus here. And there you go, you can click on this to watch the actual video of that webinar, or you can look at the PDF guide there for that webinar. So all the whenever you hear us mention webinars, this is where you go. These are good questions that we're having come in here, Katie. Um, if you don't have physical presence in the state, would we need a city or a county registration? Well, I may, maybe we should say physical or economic presence, okay? Because um, in, in under business tax law, just like sales tax law and also franchise and excise tax law, you have to determine whether you're meeting nexus thresholds, which means could mean physical, like having an employee here as an example, or it could be um, economic, like having systematic and continuous business activity in Tennessee. Um, so, so that's not a bright line answer on that. The, um, the different manuals that we have for our different tax types actually uh, talk about this nexus thing. Dan, do you have a comment on that as well? No, not on that. I was gonna wait till you were done. Okay, I'm done. My good friend Christy uh, asked for the license, will we need to uh, apply the first time and then after we file taxes every year, uh, we don't need to do anything else. Is that correct? Well, I don't know about the, we don't need to do anything else uh, part, but yeah, once you apply for the license then you would need to file uh, uh, every year, depending on your threshold. Um, but also she asked, can the license be obtained online? That's really what I wanna uh, touch have you guys touch on can the license be obtained online billy well um sort of a trick question because like i think katie alluded to it here just a second ago as well uh, it really does depend on how the cities and the counties uh, have it set up so under state law the licensing part of that is the is the function of city and county government okay so that means that they get to pick and a lot of them choose to work with us and get our electronic records and say, hey, let's just put the license out on the tin tap system. And then the taxpayers can go out there on tin tap. They can look at a copy of that license and they can print it off if they want to and they're good. Um, a lot of them do that, okay? Others choose to issue a paper license. They choose to mail you a license uh, or, or make it available to you in some other way. Um, and some of, some of the cities and counties actually forbid um, their license from going to 10 tap and they definitely have gone to the, and remain with rather, I guess is a better way to say it, the manual process of, of doing a manual license. Uh, two great examples of that are Metropolitan Nashville, Davidson County. Uh, you will not see those on 10 tap uh, and you will not see Shelby County, Memphis on there either. Okay, that, that's their choice. It's their choice. They can do that. Okay, but uh, we certainly do work very closely with those offices. We talk to them daily. Trust me, all day, about different items, different things, different adjustments, and we uh, we're glad to do that. But um, but that's how it works. And Dan, that was a good. That's a good thing to point out. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I want to bring up something here. A question from Robert, who says he's going to be under 100k in 23. He reached out, and we got and we closed his business account, right? Or is that correct? So this is an interesting question, Robert, because there's some semantics involved with that. As far as you're concerned, as far as you know, it, it's it's closed in terms of you not needing to to do anything. On our end, it we just switch the status of those accounts. If you're going to fall under that threshold, we switch the status to filing not required. So it doesn't go poof and goes go away because you may you may have a point in time where you will go over that threshold again and then we just kind of switch it. It's like turning a light switch on and off. Um, mm -hmm. If you request, if you don't think you're going to hit that hundred thousand dollar threshold and you currently have a business tax account, 
um, then then yes, reach out to us. We've mentioned this a couple of times. We won't we won't technically close it, but it'll seem that way on your end. You'll you'll get no notices to file. You won't see notice that you didn't file because we're going to switch the status of that to filing not required. Right, and Katie, just um, using your graphic right here, which I think is tremendous. Um, look at it this way, guys. Under three k, under three thousand dollars, you need nothing, nothing, zero. You do not need a business license. You do not pay business tax. In other words, if you had an account with us right now, and you're going to be under the three thousand, that's a great closure request. I'm talking about closing the right. account. That's where you want to reach out to us and say, close my account entirely. I don't need a business license. I'm under three thousand dollars. Shut it all the way down. That's that. The the more common thing is the middle part of the pyramid, the three thousand to one hundred thousand. That's where we're going to need to be making the changes. And Katie, you have very accurately said that. Uh, and then it's uh, it's a non-filing account. We're not expecting a tax return from you in the future. We're expecting you to renew, as it says in the right column directly with the clerk, the county clerk, the city clerk, okay? The $15 annually to each of those people to get a brand new license. And that's how that process works. And of course, big businesses, if your business is small now, gets to be bigger later, perfect. We want you to pay tax. Don't you want to pay tax? Sure you do because your business is improving, right? It's a small tax, by the way. Business tax is very small, but still at the same time, uh, we're there to help you on that as well, as it says on the slide. So here's an interesting question from Doug. Can some Tennessee companies be subject to all three of the major taxes, business tax, sales tax, and F&E? Oh, you the bet answer you. yes. And you the reason you. we're breaking this down per tax type with those big main three um, is because there are some, there is some nuance here. There are some some sales that aren't subject to sales tax, but those sales might still be subject to business tax. Okay, so you really have to compartmentalize when you're thinking about tax types. All right, some people get confused about they think that the F and E tax is the business tax. They're two separate taxes. Um, it's it's, right. it's and that's confusing, a, and we're going to break it down. And Katie, that's a great point too. Just here, not to beat a dead horse because we're trying to move on, but. Um, like Doug says, you know, there there are these different types of tax, and sometimes people will ask us, well, I paid franchise and excise tax, and now you're telling me I owe business tax? Isn't that double taxation? Oh, absolutely it is, okay? Why is that? Not because we at the Department of Revenue wanted it to be that way. It's because it's in state law that it's that way. Business tax is a gross receipts tax. Franchise and excise taxes are franchise and excise corporate slash that type of entity taxes. It's it's in a different code section and it's statutorily different. So yeah, it's it is it is different. But again, just to, one more time, business tax is very small, very small percentage. Every one of the rates is well less than one percent. Okay, franchise and excise tax more. Okay, and we're, we'll talk about that in just a little bit for a little while, but that's 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 it for me. And you Thanks, know, I Katie. like to, it makes me proud as a born and raised Tennessean, I like to brag about this. We have a very fiscally stable state. We're number three in the country for fiscal stability, according to a couple different uh, reputable resources. All of that without having an income tax here, y'all. That means it falls on a lot of businesses and the sales tax that we all pay live in here and that people that come in as tourists into our state pay. But as we'll talk about here in a bit in a minute, the business is rep responsible for collecting that sales tax. But even though we don't have an income tax here and are so fiscally stable, we still are considered one of the most business friendly states when it comes to taxes because the rates are low that y'all pay. Now it's a big responsibility to collect all those sales taxes, but hey, we live here or we visit Tennessee, we're all paying those. They just get collected by the business. With that, I I think what we should do here, y'all, is go ahead and take our break um, and come back and, and segue into sales tax. That way we can make sure we get through everything. And then if we have some time at the end, we'll get right back to answering questions and stuff. We've still got hundreds of questions here in this chat. And as Billy's mentioned already and Liz, um, if we don't get around to your question today or you don't see a good resource that might have your answer, we want you to reach out to us. So 
let's take a break, y'all. It's uh, well, I'm on Eastern time, so let's just say it's the it's uh, 9:45 Central, 10:45 Eastern right now. Let's take a 10 minute break and come back at five till. All right, and we'll see you here in 10 minutes. Thanks.
Oops, I was on mute. Uh, we're switching gears is what I was saying to myself only apparently. Switching gears over to sales tax. Um, we're compartmentalizing here. Don't forget about business tax, but forget about it in terms of sales tax because they're two different tax types. Just to recap about business tax, big new, big new law passed only businesses that gross over 100,000 annually are liable for business tax. You may still need a business license, even if you're under that $100,000 threshold, unless you're exempt. Um, we, we gave some, some resources of links to who is exempt from business tax and license, um, but only businesses grossing over 100,000 annually and not otherwise exempt are liable for business tax. All right, now we're gonna talk about sales tax. Sales tax incidentally is responsible for bringing in about 65% of tax revenue for the state of Tennessee. Business tax, side note here, is under 2% of our tax revenue. Uh, sales tax is the big one, and businesses don't pay sales tax per se unless they're paying it to buy things where they're not using the resale certificate. Um, we'll talk about that, but, but, but businesses are responsible for collecting it based on their sales of products and services. Here is a 50 slides condensed down into one slide about the basics of Tennessee sales tax. Um, it applies to dealers engaged in the business of making sales of taxable products and services. The consumer pays the tax, the retailer dealer is, is collecting it and then remitting it to the Department of Revenue. So in a nutshell, there are some exceptions here, but looking at this graphic, the sales of tangible personal property, which for purposes of uh, space and words, we're gonna condense that down to TPP. You'll hear us referring to TPP. That's tangible personal property. Sales of tangible personal property are taxable unless specifically exempted by law. There are some exemptions to buying things, tangible things that, that where you don't have to pay tax on it. Uh, pur purchases made by an exempt entity, for example, nonprofits, um, government. Uh, there is also purchases made by, by retailers that are gonna be reselling that product. Don't pay tax when they buy it if they present a certificate. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but then they'll, they'll charge tax on it when they go to sell it. Uh, so, some products are exempt. And then the usage, depending on how a product is used, there are some exemptions, manufacturing, agricultural usage. We'll break that down in, in a few slides here. So sales of TPP are generally taxable unless specifically exempted by law. On the flip side of that, sales of services are generally not taxable unless the law spe specifies that they are or if they are invoiced as part of a sale of tangible personal property. Um, I know it's kind of small. If you want to zoom in, I was trying to put a lot of info on one slide. You can click the little plus sign to zoom in on this, but some taxable services include repair, installation, and cleaning of tangible personal property, and that includes computer software, lodging services and rooms, short-term space rental for making sales, parking and storage of vehicles. We do have a webinar that's specifically dedicated to this topic, services that are subject to sales tax. So you have, if you are a service provider, you don't sell a thing, you sell a service and you're wondering if your service is subject to sales tax, a great webinar there and also great information in our sales tax manual. We haven't gone over and taken the little field trip over to our manuals. You heard me talk a lot about the business tax manual. We also have a great sales tax manual. So in terms of rates, how much is how much tax is sales tax? There's a state rate and a local tax rate. The state rate on most items is 7%. There's a local rate as well that depends on, on the jurisdiction. There are some special rates such as food, digital products, uh, what we call single articles, which are which are kind of the high dollar big items like a ring, a car, a piece of furniture, kind of higher dollar items. Um, you know, I, actually, I made some changes to this to this presentation. I can't remember if we have a slide dedicated to single articles. We'll see if we do. If we don't, we also have a webinar about that. 
Um, okay, so that's the big overview. We're going to break down some of that. Sales tax nexus. So this applies just in state, out of state, whatever. First question you want to ask yourself to know if this, if you need to be a business that is collecting and then remitting sales tax. First question is, do you have a physical presence in Tennessee? All right. If yes, if in-state tangible personal property sales exceed the threshold of $4,800 annually, then you do need to register for sales tax, collect it, and then file. All right. In-state service sales. So we we're just talking about some services are subject to sales tax. If you have one of, if you provide one of those services and you have a sales threshold of over twelve hundred dollars annually, you'll need to register and file uh, for sales tax. If the tangible personal property or services threshold is not met, even if you have a physical presence here, if you don't meet those thresholds, so it's maybe a really small business then you don't need to collect sales tax from your customers and then and then remit it. All right, so does the business has, have a physical presence in Tennessee? No, if the answer there is no. So we're talking basically out-of-state businesses, right? No physical presence here. Again, we have a great uh, webinar about Nexus, and also we have a webinar here that I reference reporting out-of-state sales by delivery destination, another good resource. But let's break this down about if you don't have a physical presence in Tennessee. If the economic sales threshold of $100,000 in sales to Tennessee-based customers within a 12-month period is, is met, then you do need to register and file to Tennessee sales tax. Um, if substantial nexus is met, if you've got questions about that, you need to, uh, I'm going to refer you back to the webinar about nexus in Tennessee. If economic and substantial nexus is not met, and so you don't have a physical presence here, you, you're not meeting that threshold, you don't have substantial nexus, no filing of sales tax, no collecting sales tax from Tennessee and filing with us is required. Let's see here, just to give you a few examples, I know I referred you over to um, our, a couple of webinars that we have about this. Examples of substantial nexus are going to be selling taxable services in Tennessee, telecommunication services to subscribers located in Tennessee, leasing, renting, repairing, installing, or assembling tangible personal property here in Tennessee, using employees, agents, or independent contractors to solicit or fulfill sales in Tennessee. Those are just a few examples of substantial nexus and Again, I'll refer you to the resources about that. All right, we talked a little bit about rates. The general state sales tax rate for most tangible personal property and services is 7%. There is a special rate on food that is a food and food ingredients that's 4%. Now that does not include prepared food, like restaurant food. We're talking food and food ingredients. Just think of what you would typically buy at a grocery store. Um, there's big sales tax holiday for those, but a good uh, a good notice that we have, uh, Billy or Dan or Elizabeth, if you want to pop this in the chat, I think it's just a good one. If you can locate that notice 2309, it's about our recent sales tax holiday that we had, but it's a, it's a great resource for what is considered food and food ingredients. Um, any county or incorporated city or municipality can levy a local rate. It's typically 2.75% or less. There is a link to the local rates that if you have the PDF handy or if someone here on the panel can, can grab that and pop that in the chat. But if, again, if you've got our participant guide, the PDF, you can link over to that there. Now, specified digital products are taxed at the state rate of 7% and then just a flat standard local rate. So it's not going to specify digital products, audio video products, uh, audio or visual products. Those um, are going to be a standard local tax rate of 2.5%. And we have a webinar that was dedicated solely to that topic, sales tax on specified digital products. So for single articles that are over $1,600 in price, the entire price is taxed at that 7%, then the first $1,600 is taxed at the local rate, and anything between $1,600 and $3,200 is taxed at the state single article rate of 2.75. It's a little bit of a complicated to topic, but what is considered a single article? Uh, how do you apply that rate? 
we do have a webinar dedicated to that single article tax. Some examples of a single article that are that are high dollar, so over sixteen hundred. You know, like I said, a piece of furniture, maybe a purse. Um, not my purse, but some per some some purses, shoes, a, a piece of jewelry, a car, a boat. Um, just think of anything that's a single article that's over sixteen hundred. There's kind of a special taxation involved there. Okay, a slide here about exemptions. We we touched on this on that first big general slide, but usage based examples include, for example, pollution control. Of course, anything that's usage based, it's going to be uh, supported by a valid exemption certificate. So if you are um, a business who thinks you might qualify for usage based, you would apply for that exemption, receive it, and then when you go make that purchase and don't want to pay tax, you would have to su supply your exemption certificate. The same goes for on the flip side of that, if you're if you're the retailer and someone has an exemption, that goes for any of these exemptions that we're talking about, um, except for product-based ones. Uh, we'll say here on this slide, you can see that, that it has to be supported by a, a certificate or not. If you're the retailer, you need to make sure that if someone says, hey, I have an exemption for, I'm a nonprofit, I don't need to pay tax on this, for example. They need to provide an exemption certificate, uh, and we'll talk about this later, but in that specific example, a federally issued 501c3 document, just make sure that if you're selling something to someone and they say, I don't owe tax, um, that you're collecting that exemption certificate and then keeping it on file. There are certain products that are just not subject to sales tax, no, no exemption certificate required or anything. If you sell textbooks, you sell school meals, certain healthcare items, um, they just, you don't charge sales tax on certain items. And a lot of, uh, uh, what are they called, point of sale systems that you have, have that kind of stuff plugged into them, I know. Um, there are entity-based exemptions. The government, U.S. government, state of Tennessee, TN, Tennessee counties and municipalities, they'll need to supply uh, an exemption certificate in order to not pay sales tax. Nonprofits, as I just mentioned, need to provide an exemption certificate um, or their federally issued 501c3 paperwork. Qualified farmers, um, again, supported by valid certificate and qualified manufacturers. We've got a lot more details about this. There could be, this is probably three, three, this is probably a full day session just to, to provide details about exemptions. But I would recommend to you check out chapter 18 of our sales tax manual for more about exemptions. Even if you, like I said, even if you are not, um, wouldn't qualify for any exemptions because of the type of business you are, you're going to see these exemption certificates or you may see them uh, in the course of your of your business where people are going to provide you certain certificates. If it's a valid certificate, which you want to look at it, make sure the date is, make sure that certificate is within date. If you have any questions about whether a certificate that someone gives you is valid, we do have a place on our website. Uh, actually, I think I'm going to take you over there right now. Let's let's go on a field trip. I'm going to show you where you can plug in a certificate and see if it's it's valid or not. Or you can always contact us. Um, we we see those sometimes where the, the certificates doesn't doesn't look right. It looks that's ten years old or looks doctored. That that can happen. If you have any doubt, just just reach out to us. But I'm going to show you where over on our website you can check on a certificate. So I'm on tn.gov slash revenue here. I'm going to go over to our tin tap. So this is also where you file and pay and everything. Would we'll, we'll hang out here in a little while. Elizabeth's going to talk to you about that. But let's see, I'm going to go down to, I think it's here, information and inquiries. Is this where it is? Yes, this is where you can look up certificates. Um, information inquiries and then click on sales and use tax certificate you look up. So you can look up to make to see if a, a business is is in the system there that way. Okay, moving along from exemptions, what do we have next here? Okay, the resale certificate. If you get a sales tax account, a Tennessee sales and use tax account, one of the first pieces of mail you're going to get from us is a resale certificate. You can zoom in to see a sample of what this one looks like. But basically, this is going to be a certificate that you can use to uh, purchase items without paying sales tax on them only if you are going to be reselling those items. So an example of where you would not use a resale certificate, let's say you 
have a restaurant and you're going to buy uh, cleaning supplies to clean your restaurant, brooms, mops, sprays, whatever, you're not reselling those, you're using them. So you're going to pay sales tax when you when you purchase those items. All the food you're going to be purchasing, you can use your resale certificate for that. If you're uh, whatever type of retailer you are, whatever you're going to be reselling, you can use this certificate to purchase those items without paying tax on them. They are issued by location and each location does need its own certificate. They don't expire, but become not valid. They are invalidated when a location is closed. We have a webinar dedicated to resale certificates, and you can see um, if you've got the PDF, you can link directly to that. And I know I mentioned this already, but if you're a retailer or dealer um, and someone provides you with one of these to purchase something uh, without paying tax on it, you must maintain a copy of any exemption certificate that's used. Um, and by law, you're not required to accept a certificate, but you you may want to uh, if you want if you want to maintain business from that particular cu customer. I know there are some big major retailers that that don't accept resale certificates. Um, maybe they just don't want to mess with it. I'm not sure. Okay, so registering for sales tax. Uh, we'll Liz is going to show you tin tap in a little while to register for sales tax. You'll do so on tin tap. You will be liable, we've already mentioned this, you will be liable for filing a sales tax return beginning on the date you open that sales tax account, even if no sales are made during that period. So what that means is, as, as Liz mentioned earlier, let's say you need to go ahead and start stocking your stocking your shelf, stocking your business, and you're not gonna open for several months, but you need that resale certificate right now to go ahead and start buying your products that you're gonna be reselling, right? Well, if you open that up today, a business up today, October 4th, 20. 24, you're going to be out liable for filing an October sales tax return next month. We'll talk about the due date in a minute. You have to file that return and it'll be, you will, but since you haven't made any sales yet, it'll be a zero return. You'll just file. It's actually not even, we call it filing zero, but in TINTAP, uh, which is the required way to file, the very first question says, do you have sales to report? And if you say no, then you just click through like next, next, put your password in and you're done. So you don't even actually get into the return you just say no you didn't have any sales if you don't do that then you will get stuck with penalty which is really sad to see happen we don't want to see you having to pay a penny especially if you haven't collected anything so timely filing is critical for for all the tax types but most tax accounts most sales tax accounts are set up at first as, as monthly filers we'll talk in a minute about how to switch that if your sales are low but um so out-of-state dealers can register through tintap or by accessing the streamlined sales tax registration system through one of the certified service providers all right so due dates filing here due date is the 20th day of the month following the period so i open up a sales tax account today October 4th, 2023, I said 24 earlier, didn't I? Uh, October 4th, 2023, I would have to file my October sales tax return by November 20th. If you've got your sales on, on the 1st, go ahead and do that. It'll be available as of the 1st of the month, but you've got until the 20th of the month. Well, I think this is the technically the third or fourth time we've mentioned this. Once an account is open, filing must begin even if no sales, file zero if needed. Um, we really push that because we see so much of it. Uh, I used to work in our collections division with Department of Revenue, and I can't tell you how many times we were talking to taxpayers, to customers who said, well, I didn't, I, I haven't made any sales, so I wasn't filing. And they've got the, they got those NOPAs, the Notice of Proposed Assessments, and those started piling up and we put estimated amounts out there when all you needed to do was go in there and file um, zero if, if needed there. There is no option for a filing extension with sales tax. It's due on the 20th of the month following the period. No ifs, ands, or buts about that, unless, of course, the 20th falls on a weekend. Um, as I mentioned, sales tax accounts are generally set up monthly. Uh, for more information on annual or quarterly filing, you can. there's more information about that on our website. Uh, after a year of sales, if you fall below a certain threshold, you can change your filing uh, frequency. So some great webinars and resources here that can give you more information about filing sales tax. We have a webinar dedicated to that from a couple years ago, but we are updating that as I showed you earlier this month, our monthly tax webinar that's on the last Tuesday of the month, which is Halloween this year. 
uh, so we'll have an updated webinar about completing the sales tax return because a lot has changed since our last webinar about that. Um, lots of changes to the sales tax return. So there's also a help video in our revenue help section that's called filing a sales tax return and specific information in our sales tax manual pages 27 through 29 about filing the sales tax return. So how to file. Filing is required for all of our tax types on TINTAP. Um, once you have access to your sales tax account, I did see in the chat a little while ago, people were saying, I don't see my sales tax account in there. I don't, I'm not seeing it. Could just be you don't have access to it yet and we can help you gain access to it. Uh, it would be, some people think, well, why does it, when I, when I log into TINTAP, why do all my tax accounts not automatically show up? There's different reasons for that, but it's just the way things are at this point. So we'll talk in a, in a little while about making sure you have access to all your tax accounts. But once you do have access to your sales tax account in TINTAP, you'll see the account listed from your TINTAP homepage. You would just click on view and file returns. That's how you would also file an amended return. Um, there's a section there where you can just click file now. You can use vendor software to input your return data. That's very common, especially with sales tax because a lot of your point of sale systems um, kind of calculate all that for you. And there's a link for, uh, not, not a link, but a, a path you can follow for information about software venues. It's tn.gov slash revenue, then e-filing information, then electronic filing using a software vendor. We see that a lot with sales tax though. All right. So we're going to move right along to talk about, actually before we do, let's stop. We're about to talk about F&E a little bit um, and then some other taxes. I'm going to turn the chat back on for you to be able to put your questions about sales tax into the chat. Oops, I think maybe I never turned I it think off. It's, I was going to say, I think it's still on, Katie. So okay. uh, you, your <laughs> job is done. How about that? Okay. All right. Well, I haven't even been looking at it. Are there a million questions over in there? Two million, three million questions? Lots. Oh, I'll go with two million. <laughs> we got and, a lot of um, we've here. been trying to plug them, but uh, people have got okay. a lot of questions here, obviously. Anything to mention uh, to the whole group that are some? Um, you know, we were getting kind of a mix of everything here. It's sort of hard to comment on as far as that goes. If you're not seeing something on TinTap that you ought to be seeing, call us and let us look at your account, <clears throat> excuse me, directly, you know, give us your account number and let us pull it up on our side so that we can see maybe what the situation is as far as that goes. But um, one thing, Katie, you mentioned about filing, you know, when, when you are presented with a yes or a no question on TINTAP, regardless of whatever type of tax you're filing, make sure that you answer yes or no to every one of your questions. If you don't answer it, uh, it will not proceed. Okay, so that's uh, that's sort of important there too. And um, we yeah, don't there's, talk there's... about use tax in this presentation today. Um, mm -hmm. Lots. Let me give you, let me give y'all like a thirty second tour of use tax. Okay, so so well, I don't know why I know this. I just do. Uh, did you know that sales tax started in 1947 in the state of Tennessee? How about that? Why do I know that? I don't know why I know that, but I do know it. Uh, I do know that I was taught that use tax started the very same day, okay? What use tax is, is it's basically a brother-sister sort of relationship. So use tax is the same rate, same as everything else. Typically, there's two types of use tax. One is when you bring things into Tennessee from outside the state, you owe use tax on that, okay? Whether you're Katie and you're going into Georgia and buying a house full of carpet, uh, Katie needs to file a consumer use tax return and, and pay that if the uh, carpet uh, supplier in Georgia did not charge Tennessee tax, okay, which they probably didn't. Um, so that's an example. The other use tax is when you're operating a business and you have inventory that you have bought uh, with using a resale certificate, okay, 
and you pull that item out of the inventory and you use it in the business, then whatever the value is of that item, you need to self-assess your use tax on that. And typically that's done on the sales tax return. There is a line for use tax on the front of the return that you can claim that and go ahead and file that there once you're registered for sales tax. So the consumer use tax return isn't really what you'd want to do because you're already registered for sales tax. That's a, a very short part of use tax. We could talk probably an hour about use tax, but that's that's basically it. I'm seeing some questions in here in the chat that uh, sometimes, especially with should I charge sales tax or not, it's not always a super cut and dry topic. We might have 20 questions for you to follow up to make sure. For example, IT and computer and software related things, um, it, it depends. I know that's an, an annoying answer to say, but it will depend on a lot of different things. We are having a webinar because Richard here has, has a question about IT support. Um, He's not providing a physical product, but there's IT support. Again, I would probably have 20 more questions to for you to ask about uh, whether your services are subject to sales tax, but we are having a webinar next month. Huge topic, software as a service or SaaS. Um, again, our, our laws are coming along and catching up with the with modern times. A few years ago, there was uh, every year, I'd say there's there's new laws passing about this topic. So that's why we're dedicating a webinar to that specifically next month. But if you have a question in here um, about whether your service is subject to sales tax or your product that you're selling um, and we're not answering it live on here, it might be because there's a bunch more questions we have for you. And with so many people, we can't have really an interactive discussion. So call us, reach out to us. You may find the answer that you need in our manual, but if not, again, reach out to us um, specifically. Richard, me, I'm looking at your question here. Hey, Katie, let me address one thing that Ryan had here in the chat. It says, you say that a sales tax report needs to be filed even if it's zero, but on one slide showed no sales taxes due nor registration needed if sales are below 4,800. This is contradictory. Not really. Um, to, to, to not, and not to be smart about that, right? So it's a valid question, but let me explain what we mean by that. So we don't want you to register for sales tax unless you need to be registered for sales tax. And if you do, and you're a business that's located in Tennessee, if you have $4,800 or more on an annual basis uh, in sales of tangible personal property, uh, or $1,200 of taxable services, then you need to register, okay? Then if you have zero on a sales tax return for any particular period, you would file zero, okay? But so, the, so there's the, the registration requirement, then there's the filing requirement. Those are two different things. Those are apples and oranges. But I, that's seriously, Ryan, that's a good question. And, and I'm glad that you brought it up. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the other taxes portion here. Um, let's see, we'll turn off chat for a little while and move along here. And I hope we have some time at the end, um, if I just don't talk as much, right? Talk too much, uh, to, to open up the chat for more questions as well. So other taxes, we're going to focus here on franchise and excise. And just like business tax and sales tax, this is my everything crammed into one slide, basics f &E tax slide here. So franchise and excise tax is basically a combination of two different taxes, franchise and excise tax. Franchise tax is the greater of net worth or book value of real or tangible property that is owned or used in Tennessee. That combined with the excise tax, which is basically your net income combines to make the f and &E tax. We do have a great webinar that's f and &E basics and we have an f and &E manual, those two links you can see there. So filing for f, excuse me, for f and &E is uh, a little bit different than the other tax types um, depending on, on your income, basically or on your previous filings. So again, just like with a uh, business tax, it's gonna be due on the 15th day of the fourth month following the end of your tax year, okay? There is an ability to 
uh, extend that seven months, which that was a law that pays, passed last year. Typically, it used to be just like the, the IRS deadline used to be six months. So for an April 15th deadline, you had till October 15th. Now in Tennessee, you have a seven month extension, so you can file on 11 on November 15th. Um, hey, something real quick, Katie, on them. Sure. That is a filing extension, not a payment extension. We get that question every single day. Right. So, so you you got to have all your money in by um, in this example here, April fifteenth. Okay, to avoid penalty. All right. Um, so just just rem just understand that there's there's that component of it. Okay. Yeah, there's some other options, and we've got a slide next about about how to have a valid extension, like what what you would need to pay. But uh, yeah, it's not granted automatically. If you have not done any business, let's say you just chartered with the Secretary of State and business hasn't made any income, you have no assets, there is a minimum still due of $100 a year. I heard Billy reference that earlier. Um, that would be, uh, it's a $100 minimum. We have a slide here in a few minutes about an easy way just to pay that minimum. But again, F&E taxes due on the first 15th day of the fourth month following the fiscal year end. Now, if you have, uh, sir, if you, I think we have a slide about this too for extensions. We do. There are some estimated, I'm sorry, for estimated payments. We, we uh, do require estimated payments for certain businesses that have filed a certain amount. Historically, you're going to be required to file. Uh, it's not quarterly. It's almost quarterly, but uh, for estimated payments throughout the year. So what the little timeline you're looking at here is for a business in this example that has a fiscal year end of 1231, the first quarterly payment is due on April 15th. The second one is due on June 15th. The third quarterly payment on September 15th. And then your final quarterly payment is gonna be due on January 15th. Uh, we'll talk some more about that here in a minute. So who is liable for F&E tax? That's the big question, right? What do you, who, do you, do you have to register? for this tax and uh, have a tax requirement for it. Well, all for-profit foreign and domestic entities chartered with the Secretary of State, qualified or registered in Tennessee or doing business in Tennessee must file the F&E tax return and pay at least the minimum tax. So again, if you're still on the fence with deciding whether you wanna be a sole proprietorship or an LLC or whatever, that's something to take into effect. So if you're a sole P, sole proprietorship, um, you will not be liable for F&E tax. Pretty much everything else, um, except for nonprofits, you're gonna you're gonna be uh, on the hook for F&E. General partnerships are also not subject to uh, franchise and excise tax. So we get that question a little bit too. Yes. But okay. but again, going back to something we said early on, um, LLCs. Uh, that that's the hot one. That's everybody wants to be an LLC. It may be fine for your business. We're not going to tell you it's not or whether it is or not because that's your decision, right? But but just understand that if you decide to set up an LLC, bag you're it. This mm -hmm. whole slide applies to you. Okay, so whether you decided to do something with it or not, so. Um, and we'll talk some more here a little bit later about getting out of business. We're talking about starting your business now, but getting out of business is very important too to do it precisely. So we'll we'll spend some time talking about that in a little bit too. Thanks. So thanks, Billy. Uh, that reminded me to something else to mention. So if if you have chartered with the Secretary of State and you have not yet registered for F and E tax you're gonna get a letter from us because we share information, just like we share share data and information with the city and county clerks. We work closely with the Secretary of State's office. They will send us data about who has chartered, who has registered with them. And then again, if you haven't registered with us yet for f and &E tax and you have registered with Secretary of State, you'll get a mail, uh, a letter from us in the mail that says, hey, we see that you have, uh, chartered and but you haven't yet set up your F&E tax account you need to reach out to us you need to go and register for F&E tax um, likewise if you just in name only if you if the if your business name is Liz's Bakery LLC or Liz's Bakery Inc uh, we're assuming that that is 
by, by the, by the name that you've given yourself that you are limited liability or you are incorporated and therefore are on the hook for F and E also. So that's where going way back to the very beginning of the, of today's workshop comes into play. Uh, right, Liz? Yes. Um, and just to add to that, um, first of all, I love the example of Liz's bakery because I love bread. Um, but we have a lot of walk-ins that are not aware of F and E, and if they register to Secretary of State, that they need to register for F and E an account with us. So a lot of times, we'll they'll walk in and they'll say, "Well, they told me to come here and do X, Y, and Z." So we help them register, and they have chartered with Secretary of State from 2017, 2018, 2019. So going back to what I said previously, that's the date that your tax obligation begins. So we register you as of that date. And unfortunately, F and E, there's a minimum of $100. So every year that you were already registered, you're liable for that. So if, if you're going to be an LLC or you register with Secretary of State, make sure you get that F and E account. That way you're on top of it and you don't owe any back taxes. Right, Liz, and that $100 that you mentioned is a minimum that that's really basically, even if your business was not making any money or actually mm -hmm. operating, didn't have any tangible personal property or real property or anything, but even just some people have a, have an idea for a business, right? Uh, we see this happens a lot. They come in and we see a lot of registrations come in from Friday and Saturday nights. They're like, oh, this great idea. They're hanging out with their friends and they have this great idea to start a business. And next thing you know, you're on the hook for all this and don't even realize what you just did. So also, likewise, a lot of times they'll, um, a lot of people will hire a business to set them up for everything. Just make sure you know you're you know what you're getting set up for. If you have done that, there are a lot of online companies that will do this for you, uh, registered agents and stuff. Just be careful about making sure you know what you're registered for, because it is going to be registered for in your name, in your LLC's name, in your so under your social, however it is, they may set you up for stuff. You just need to make sure that that's communicated well. Um, I remember seeing that a lot when I worked in collections, hearing that from from cust from taxpayers that would say, I didn't even realize <laughs> that I had all these tax accounts even set up for me. They just, you know, didn't realize that that's what they were doing when they got with that that person to help them set up their business. So um, this is some information, this slide here about the extension process. So to receive a seven month extension, taxpayer must have paid on or before the original due date. So again, for your typical company that has a 1231 fiscal year, you need to have paid on or before April 15th an amount equal to or greater than 90% of the current period's liability or 100% of the pe previous period's liability or $100 if the previous period does not exist. So wherever that falls for you, it falls for you. 90% of current period liability, you'd think, well, if I knew what that was, I would just go ahead and file, right? But that's not always, f &E tax return um, might take you a little bit more time to prepare. A lot, of, a lot of people do hire professionals to help them with that. Um, but we'll talk here in a minute about how easy just that minimum filing is. The extension is automatic if the payment requirements for receiving an extension have been met or if a valid federal extension has been filed. More information about this in our manual on page 93. Oops, okay. The minimum filing. So if you've ever filed a full F&E return, I know we probably have some tax professionals on here, you know it's a pretty complicated, lots of different schedules, pretty complicated return. Um, a lot of a lot of taxpayers tackle it themselves and you know you know it's pretty complicated well minimum filing is easy it really is i'm not just saying that um all right so we've got information about this in our f and e manual on page 159 but basically on that 10 tap main page before you even log in or you have to put in all your 10 tap information you can click on view return links and then just file minimum F and E tax. It'll ask you for some key pieces of information about your business. Uh, basically, you're just going to need your account number, your entity ID number, so your FEIN in this case, um, and basically just pay the hundred dollars. You don't even have to log in. It's very simple. We just don't want to see you miss that deadline, though. You want to, if you don't have any real or tangible assets or no business income, but you are registered with the Secretary of State. 
um, you still would need to file this minimum. Easy way to do it here. Those estimated payments that I talked about, so you're required to make estimated payments when there is a combined F&E tax liability of $5,000 or more for both the prior tax year and the current year. So if that would apply to you, if your tax liability for last year and then you think it's going to be for this year, $5,000 or more, then you're going to be on the hook for these estimated payments um, that are kind of quarterly. But uh, more information on page 109 of the F&E manual, there is penalty and interest that can be applied, that will be applied if those, if you are liable for estimated payments and don't make them timely. Okay, so that was just a little bit of information about a big giant tax, F&E tax. Um, would just have some great resources available to you for more information, but don't really, <coughs> excuse me, have the time to dive too deep into a, a very complex tax type right now for purposes of this new business workshop. But we also have a lot of other tax types. We have over two dozen different state taxes and fees that may apply to your business. We just talked in detail or in some detail about business tax, sales tax, and F&E. But if, as Liz was mentioned earlier, if you're going to be selling alcohol, you may need a liquor by the drink tax account tire fee, motor fuels, tobacco taxes. Um, for information on all the different tax types, you're going to go to our website. What I would do, what I would advise you to do just to have a quick overview to make sure you're covering all the bases for your business, I'm going to go back over to our website real quick, over to the web browser. A lot of tabs open now. Open another one. Okay, so I'm on tn.gov slash revenue now. Um, hopefully that's what y'all see. And I'm going to click on taxes. You can also click on the tile here. I'll do that. Taxes. And you see here, just like in line with what we've been talking about, the most common are business tax, franchise and excise, and sales and use. Several different alcohol, beer, and tobacco taxes. We call those the sin taxes. Um, if you are going to be selling any of those items, you may want to check out the different tax pages that we have for brand registration, wine tax, beer taxes, LBD, tobacco. Um, Locally administered taxes are not really going to apply to your to, to taxpayers. That's going to apply to local governments. But okay, see here, archive, uh, other taxes, I'm sorry. This is where I would just kind of peruse this list and see if you think that any of these may apply to your business. Um, let's not worry about those right now. Okay. And when you click on an individual tax page, for example, um, and I usually go over this at the end, but just because we usually run out of time. I'll go ahead and show you now since I'm right here already. Um, when you click on a tax page, um, business tax, you're going to see a overview and then a kind of a menu over here to the left that's different information about that tax, due dates and tax rates, registration and licensing. Now this is going to look different for the different tax types, whatever the main topics are under a tax type. Um, a way to get over to our manual. There's a, there's a couple different ways to get to the tax manuals, but if you click on tax guidance, that'll take you directly over to the business tax manual right there. Now, someone earlier was asking, how can I find out which jurisdictions have business tax? Um, I can't remember whether that's here or on the next page. Billy or Liz or Dan, can y'all help me out? That's somewhere on this page where they somebody asked that in the chat. Maybe maybe. Hey, what was the question that. again? I'm sorry. Uh, how to find out which jurisdictions have business, which municipalities do business tax? Okay, so let's go to the business tax page. Okay. Here we go, and let's look up. Oh, uh, right here. Yeah, right there. So this is uh, this is really cool. This is new. <clears throat> fairly yeah, new. And just put see, your cursor over the county. Yep. And then it lists see. all the little cities within there. And if mm -hmm. it says, if there's, doesn't say impose business tax, then it doesn't. If it's blank, that means there's no if business tax. it's blank, tax. right. So for example, right. here in Hamilton County, um, the municipality of Ridgeside does not have business tax. Right. 
the only municipality within Montgomery County that has business taxes, Clarksville. Is that the only municipality? That would be the only municipality in, in Montgomery County. I think, I, uh, I think that's pretty much right. Yeah. Okay. So pretty cool dashboard. This is this is new. Um, I haven't played around a whole lot with it yet. So a good at a glance way to see. Go to, hey, Katie, go to Williamson County real quick on your map. Is that Williamson? Yeah. Yeah. See, Nolensville. Nolensville is not listed, and Nolensville is getting to be kind of large, uh, mm -hmm. quite honestly. But uh, ironically, That's they've right. never – the reason they don't have it, guys, is because the local government has never enacted the statutes uh, necessary to, to have business licensing mm -hmm. in their community. So they've, they've just never chosen to do it. You can download a printable version here. Uh, likewise, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit over to – I saw a question in the chat. Y'all, I think I might see a sneeze coming. Let's see if I can find my mute button fast. <laughs> oh, my allergies. Okay, I think it went away. Um, someone was asking about the different sales tax rates as well. Let's see if I can navigate. Y'all y'all quiz me here. How, how quickly can I navigate over to where all the local sales tax rates are? So I'm going to go up to taxes and click on sales and use tax and then local tax. And then here we go. Same thing. There's a There's a local sales tax rate map. And look kind of similar to that business tax map that we looked at and you can just hover over and see what the local rate is for um, all the jurisdictions within a county now one one thing to talk about on that katie too is you know if you're a business that's in tennessee and you're selling from your location um, then you're only impose the local tax for for your actual location, regardless of where the Tennessee customer is located. Okay, uh, if you're an out of state business, it works differently, and you actually have to determine where your customers are and charge the local tax based on where the customers are. If you're an out of state business, so we um, had a slide. I'm yeah. going to go back to it. I'm going to see how how fast I can pinpoint this slide. A slide about it was over on the sales tax nexus slide 20 um, that has a link over to that reporting out-of-state sales by delivery destination webinar so if you've got mm -hmm. the pdf it's on page 20 um, that's a for out-of-state businesses that's a really really good one mm -hmm. all right let's see i'll go back over here um Trying to get back where I left off. Okay, so moving right along here, uh, general tax account information, delinquencies. We Nobody wants to see this happen to anybody. Penalty and interest do apply to any deficient or delinquent payment. That deficient would mean if you paid but didn't pay enough. Um, delinquent would mean late. Uh, a penalty of 5% of the unpaid amount is added for each month up to a maximum of 25%. So you're looking at 5% for the first month that it's late, then 10, 15, 20, up to 25. Interest is computed at the current rate of interest. Who knows? Who can tell me now what that is? What's our current interest rate? Is it 8? Am I right about that? Not fair, Katie. I'm not prepared to answer your question. Look, I'm going to show you how I find that real quick because it changes every year. So I just uh, don't work in that every day. Okay, here's how I always do it. I go over to Revenue Help, and I click in interest rate and see I'm just showing y'all right here how to find answers quick penalties and interest I think it's that first one this will tell you right here so um okay I was wrong that's that's lower than I thought the, um let's see the oh it is I was right sorry it is eight percent the interest rate on all taxes collected or administered by the Department of Revenue is currently eight we do have installment payment agreements. Um, we're not talking about that today. The interest rate on those is 11%, so it's higher. We have a webinar uh, about the collections process and tax enforcement that we did earlier this year. If you want more information about installment agreements and what happens in the whole process of what happens when you're late and the collections process, um, a good webinar about that. So, all right. We've got about 45 minutes left and we still have to talk about um, resources. So I think I'm just going to invite Liz back in here to go over Tintap and then save your questions about these general tax stuff and F&E stuff um, towards the end. So I'm, I'm going to save some time for the end. Let me pass it back over to you, Liz. Pass the baton. 
pass the baton the button baton there you go so you're going to talk to us about tin tap and then i'm going to go yep. back over to our website to show some more resources and then we'll have question time again sounds good thank you ma'am all right so tin tap for all of you guys who are already registered or kind of familiar with it that's going to be your life from here on out as a new business owner or already is as a business owner um, so you are going to be able to do everything on here. This is, like I said, going to be bread and butter. Um, so you're going to be able to register and file um, for all of the taxes that your business needs that you're liable for. You will be able to see everything um, in the next couple of slides. We'll kind of break that down for what you're viewing or a lot of the questions in the chat were, why can I not see this? Um, we'll kind of break that down for you. Um, also, that way you can familiarize yourself, kind of have a heads up on that. Um, you are able to schedule payments in advance. Sometimes you're, you're filing, you, you got everything in order, but maybe, I don't know, life is tough. Maybe you don't get paid until X date, right? So you can schedule your payments um, for maybe the 20th when it's due. Have it come out that, that moment and you'll be squared away and you'll be all set up and ready to go. So you have that option on Tintap. Um, there is an automatic correction of common errors. So a lot of our slides had that little um, circle with the upside down exclamation point. If there is an error on your return or on one of the pages that you are on in TinTap, it's not going to let you proceed until you get rid of that error. So it's it's a really good um, cushion, I guess, to lean back on to make sure that you're doing everything correctly. So if you see a little red um, circle or you notice something and it's not maybe letting you hit next or submit, that's why. Um, so just pay attention to little details like that. Um, Tintap is going to allow you to amend returns. So a lot of times people are, are like, oh man, I don't know my gross or I don't know the exact amount with you know, cents, which are not included, but if you, if you need to make any corrections whatsoever, um, you are able to go back into that specific return, whether it be the, the year or a specific month, you can click on it and amend it. So there is, um, we're human, like I love to say, um, so you can, you can fix everything is fixable. Everything is figure outable. So you have that option there. Um, and then you have the ability to access returns, um, previous returns that you may have filed last year. Um, you have all of that under this one website for you. Certificates and letters, um, like Katie and Billy mentioned before, you can, you can see your certificates there. And then I'll show you another slide of where you can find your letters that we kind of push out to your TinTap portal. Um, so lots, lots, lots to see there. Um, that's the website, tn.gov forward slash revenue and then TinTap. Um, and then in the circle there on the on the PowerPoint, um, it says all taxpayers should have access to a master TINTAP account. Um, I'm probably going to say this a couple more times. It's something that we see a lot with our walk ins. Um, they say, oh, well, I have a CPA or my accountant does that. That's awesome. You know, more power to both of y'all. But if you want to see something and you don't have time to contact your CPA or maybe you fire your CPA or something happens, you want to make sure that you still have that power over your business, over your accounts and over everything. So you logging in as a master gives you the ability to not only see what they're doing on their end, but to make sure everything is up to par so that you feel comfortable so that you can sleep better at night, knowing that you have um, that, avail that available to you. What's up, Katie? I just wanted to piggyback on that thought, Liz. If you're a, I, I saw, I could tell from the chat that we did have some accountants or tax preparers, tax professionals in here too. Uh, if you have, because when TimTap first started five or so years ago, a lot of tax professionals set up master level access to their customers' accounts. If you are a tax professional or you're a business who who thinks your accountant may have that master level access that's something we can help you fix for tax professionals you don't want to have master level access to any of your client accounts you want to have third party access to your customers accounts it's a lot easier for you too you can see them all listed when you log in instead of having to log into each one individually but it just happened that that's the way some got set up back in the early days of TinTap. We were at a, a tax workshop recently in Knoxville where one of the CPAs that was there was like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that I could see. She logs into each one of her clients. She's like, it takes forever. I want to fix that. So we can help you do that. And we also, if you're a tax preparer that's in this workshop or listening um, to the video, 
help us help your customers by telling them that they do need that master level access there it's just a, it's a it's a second layer of checking even if they hire you to do everything if, if a tax preparer professional does everything i like to say it's just like having bank account access at least at a glance mm -hmm. access to be able to look in there and make sure everything's in green and you don't have anything in red um, we're all human and even tax professionals can miss a deadline here and there or whatever um, doesn't happen very often i will say they're pretty they're usually pretty on the ball but also like liz said being able to view your letters um, you need you, you you want to be able to see if you're if you're a business and your uh, accountant has hundreds of clients, let's say, they may not get around to reading every single letter that's under every single customer's account and some stuff that we just need to communicate with you for. So if for no other reason, just having that at a glance, okay, someone else is doing all that and filing and doing all that, but I wanna see just an at a glance view and I wanna see what communication has been sent to my business, right? Absolutely. Yeah, all all of the good things, <laughs> all of them. I know I like to be in control and especially the business aspect. I mean, that's really important. So you should have access no matter who you hire or how many people. Um, so that's just another tidbit to take away um, and hopefully it benefits you in the long run. Um, resources, resources, resources. So I am going to put this in the chat. That way you guys can kind of browse around. Um, it's just another place where you can go and see how to videos and um, we had a lot of questions in the chat about where was this one located and they're they're mainly in the same part, but about so many different things. So, as you can see here on the slide, uh, that's where I just went to find out the interest rate. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I use our resources every day. I use our oh, manuals. Yeah. I use revenue help all day, every day. Absolutely. We, I mean, we don't know everything, um, especially not at the top of our head. So that is something that I know call center uses. We use in our regional offices. If it's not something that we're like, oh man, or we're dealing with multiple people with multiple questions, definitely go there. Um, but you learn more about TinTap, about how to log on, the registration process, payments in TinTap, um, tax returns, so many videos and resources available to you. So I cannot stress that enough. Um, we also promote these a lot to our walk-in taxpayers because, once again, I hate them having to drive to Nashville and pay for parking or taking time away from life to do something that could have been answered with just a quick click or, you know, a phone call. Um, so definitely make sure that you're accessing this, you're familiar with it, and you use it because that's what it's there for. All right, so this is kind of neat too. Um, we all love talking to humans, right? We don't like bots, although this is 50 50. Um, this is our TinTap website, right? So, as you can see here, um, there's a little message box right next to that um, question mark in the top right corner. Um, so, what it does, it allows you to ask a question and it uses the keywords from your message. Um, to kind of search our database to give you um, an automatic response, right? So if you're still not figuring it out or you still haven't received the answer that you're looking for, you have two options. There's one that says send a message and then there's another one that's the link that um, I believe we've already provided. I'll provide it again here in just a second um, to the contact page. Um, so if you guys want to take a look at that, I will do the one that says send us a message first. And then I'll go ahead and add that contact page again, just so if there was anybody that popped in or um, it was lost in the chat, those are both links. So the send a message um, creates a ticket and you go into this page and you fill out all the pertinent information regarding your thoughts and your question, and it gets sent to what's called Zendesk for us. So we will get your message and we will respond as soon as we can. Most of the time it's within a couple of minutes because we have a team that focuses on your messages, right? Some people, I'm not a phone call person. I like to email. I like having that correspondence for multiple reasons and multiple purposes. So for some people, this is what benefits them the most. So we have that there for you. And then if not, give us a call um, and we can help you either way. But that is another resource that's available to you right on our TenTap um, webpage. So super, super cool, super, super useful. All right. So now we're getting into the good stuff and hopefully um, we answer a lot of questions that was in the chat just by these couple of next slides. So this has a lot of information, right? There's a, a few things circled. The most um, 
frequently used one or the one that I suggest to be used a lot is if you ever get lost in translation or you're you're too in into one account and maybe you're like, oh man, where did I go? I need to get back. Always go home, right? What was it like uh, the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, always go home. Um, that's how I like to think of it. So if you get lost or you need to go back to the very, very start, there's that home uh, button that says tin tap, click on there, it'll bring you right back to this screen. On this screen, this is not what it looks like for everybody. So once you first register, you're just going to see tin tap, the entity name or your name, and then those little favorite summary action center. So what you're going to have to do is you have to add access to your accounts, right? So what that means is if you registered your business and you know you need business tax account, you'll have to go in, enter your letter ID number. It'll ask you a couple questions, but you have to link it. And that's an important part. Um, a lot of taxpayers are still unfamiliar with this. They kind of don't know how to. So if you use your resources, you've watched videos and you still can't get it, you can contact us and we can kind of walk you through that. Um, it just, it's all also up to you about which accounts you want to see. So going back to you having your master log on, you can see all of them. You can only, if you really want to see just your sales tax, you have the option to, to make that your view also, which is super cool, simple process. Um, so just remember to gain access to your accounts. So those who asked in the chat, Hey, I registered, but I can't see anything. You'll have to go ahead and add it. And I will talk more about that here in the next section. Um, over to your right where it says manage your profile. This is going to be any information that you want to make changes on regarding your Tintap account or the accounts within it. Um, so you will click on that. You can change your email address, um, things like that. Once again, that are pertinent to your Tintap account, excuse me, your Tintap logon. Um, and then once you gain access to all of your accounts, for example, what you see here, business tax, franchise tax, they each have their own sections. So you can make a payment for your business tax account. You can make a payment for your franchise tax account. Um, same thing with view file returns and then additional, um, additional actions and licenses. So each um, account has their own section. So if you go into file returns for F&E, in that section, but you wanted to file a return for business tax, you're in the wrong spot. So you have to just pay, pay a little bit of attention to where you're going and for which account, if that makes sense. All right. And then jump in into our action center. So that once again, it is on the main page. So if you see the action center and it has a little red circle, remember red is very important. Um, it means, hey, come over here. So if you go into the Action Center page, you'll see seven unread messages or, hey, you have a balance due. And it tells you, once again, if you look over to the left side, which account that balance due pertains to. So if you owe it on multiple accounts, it would give you a breakdown on that. Um, so you're able to see all that information. It, it tells you, hey, this return is due. Um, so make sure that you go ahead and file that. So Action Center is just kind of the important details that pertains to both your Tintap account and the accounts that are registered within it. So like a hello, hey, how you doing? Um, pay attention to me. So if you see that, make sure um, you go into each and every one of them and you take care of your accounts and everything that pertains to that. Um, so super, super important tab there on Tintap. Um, make sure you're going into daily or if you see that little red circle. All right. Tin tap more. So once again, at that very top bar, it has the favorite summary action center more. More has, more has a ton of information for you. Um, it has a search bar. So if you're looking for something and you don't have the time to, oh my gosh, where is this at? Um, you can definitely filter it by using the search bar. All of these um, small sections pertain to, to different things. So managing accounts. Um, this is where if you do not see anything when you first log into Tintap, you will go. So that very first hyperlink, register a new account, um, register a new location, gain access to an account. That's what you're going to use to put in that letter ID number so that you are able to see your business tax account. So you are able to see your franchise tax account. That's that third one is going to be key. And then look up the tax account number. So you have that um, available to you also. The payment section, here's where we talked about 
maybe you didn't know you had a you know file a zero return or maybe you didn't know uh, you were in collections and you you need to make a payment plan you can request that on here so a lot of times um, you think you have to call you don't unless you would like to we're more than happy to help you or if you want to speak to an officer whoever you need to, to speak with but you have that option available to you here um, you can also cancel a payment plan so if you have one already in the works and you no longer need it or you want to pay it off you're more than welcome to do so also yes katie another thing i used to see a lot when i worked in collections i'm gonna keep talking about that liz you did too you probably saw this too yeah specifically with payments a lot of people will plug in or, or have your CPA or accountant plug this in, plug in your bank account information. Yep. If you change banks, make sure you update that if you've got it plugged in as a payment channel for paying your, your taxes, your monthly sales taxes. It's, it's easy just to plug in. We all do that with a lot of different accounts that we have, right? You have just auto, you can, these aren't auto payments. You still have to click a button. We, we don't auto draft uh, just without you filing a return, but you if you change banks don't forget you may need to change your your information with us or have to cancel your card and get another one because it was compromised i saw i would see it happen pretty often where someone fell into collections thinking that they paid we of course would send a letter saying hey we we tried to ding that tried to get your bank account tried to charge that bank account that you told us to but it didn't work and another thing that can happen there is that there is an insuff insufficient funds penalty that'll get mm -hmm. taken too so just make sure that and that's where you would do it right there in that payment section yeah yeah there's there's tons you can do just within this this small section there's a bunch of um different paths you can go through so thank you for adding that um, additional services, a ton, a ton of stuff. You can print your certificates. You can view your certificates. Um, you can request a refund, submit that POA that maybe you need somebody to take care of something for you because you're going out of country. Um, this is something we used to do before we had Tintap. It, everything would be paper and it'd be tangible items, but now you have the ability to do it online. Um, so I think that's super important. Um, surety bond forms, bond writer forms, obtain a franchise and excise tax clearance. So that is neat. Also, we have a lot of taxpayers that come in. In Nashville, it makes sense because they're walking over from the Secretary of State building. But if you're in a different regional office or you're a different part of the state and you need that tax clearance for whatever reason, you can obtain one from here. So check that out, click into it, um, do your research, but everything is at your fingertips. Um, and then apply or renew F and E tax exemption. That's another option also. Access is going to go back to master logons, third party. If you are the master, you have the ability to remove and add access um, for and from your tax accounts. So once again, if you have that CPA, you, you no longer need their services. You're like, I got this. I can do it by myself. You can go into that access and manage it. Um, so that's a very important part of um, your Tintap account. Um, so once again, go in there, use it, click around. Um, names and addresses, same thing, is this as easy as it sounds. If you need to um, update your name or maybe you changed your last name, you can go in there, edit it. And then addresses, mailing address, mailing address, mailing address. <laughs> Please make sure that is update, updated and current um, as often as you can check it or if you do move. Um, if you're doing anything in that sense, just think about us and everywhere else and go ahead and make sure that that's up to date. Letters, everything we try to push through to Tintap, um, everything that we can. If we're sending you stuff, check your Tintap because it's going there also. Um, as long as you have that e-correspondence active and everything is good to go there, you will have all your letters um, in your Tintap account. Another thing I want, it's not on this screen that I just want to add, um, whenever you do anything on Tintap, it saves. So you, there's a confirmation page and a little number that pops up. You don't have to print it unless you do like keeping tangible documents, maybe at your desk or in a folder, but everything is saved. And this is going to kind of segue um, into submissions. Um, that submissions box at the very bottom, you can't really see it, but there is a section for that. So being technology friendly and everything being online, it's kind of like your own paper trail. So everything that you have submitted, whether it be a draft or an actual return that's been processed, it's going to be in your Tintap account. Um, so just keep that in mind, um, whether it be payments, returns, it's it's there, it's staying there. Um, so it's your own little paper trail of events. So lots of information, 
lots of stuff for you to click around in and see. Just remember, this is a super useful resource and we're, we're pushing everybody to go ahead and create that Tintap account. Um, so if you can or you haven't already, go ahead and play around in there, create your stuff and just be ready to use it. I think you're muted, Katie. Okay, there we go. I always forget that. I was reiterating what you said about go in there and just click around. Um, I always tell people to be careful about playing too much in terms, there's nothing we can't undo, but definitely just clicking around is something that is, that is encouraged. Um, you might want to make sure before you do any actions and change things that you're that you're doing it in the right place. And mm -hmm. where the link that Liz put in earlier and that revenue help, um, the page that I went to and I'm about to show you again, uh, if you have a question about what something does in Tintap, you can always type it into that little assistant or on the screen you're seeing right now, that little, the little chat box looking thing, that's the bot that will search all of our articles. So you don't even have to get out of here and go over into Revenue Help. You can do it from right here. You can click in like, how do I change my blank? Um, you can either search the search buttons, the search field there, or the, the Tintap Assistant. And if you get stuck, again, that assistant can let, allows you to send a message directly to us. So definitely um, explore Tintap. Um, we encourage that. It does so much. We couldn't cover it in a, in a week-long uh, session. I think there's over 100 Revenue Help articles about all the different functions of Tintap. So I'm going to, oh, you already passed it over, back over to me. Thank you, Liz. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of other resources here that are external resources that we have compiled that for any new business would be helpful. And then I'm going to take you back over to our website, show you some stuff I've already shown you, and then a few new places too, and then we'll take some, some questions here at the end. So these are some resources, miscellaneous help. We've compiled this list uh, that would be helpful to any new business. Like I said, the first one is the Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development. They have a great online tool. It's called the Smart Start Guide. There's also a portal. We've got links there if you've got our PDF available or, and open to you right now that will walk you through. We've only today just discussed look, Tennessee taxes, right? We've talked a little bit about how they tie in with the Secretary of State and with your business license and this, but there's so much other stuff involved. This this uh, Smart Start Guide, the Department of Economic and Community, the ECD puts out is very exhaustive. It talks about everything from setting up your bank accounts and uh, marketing and all kinds of great stuff. Tennessee Small Business Development Center, I think that Billy mentioned that earlier, another great resource. There's a link to their website. Basically, it's lo it, they're, they're located throughout the state, all these centers that will provide counseling and training to help small businesses. Um, a lot of their resources are free. They do have a step-by-step -step business planning workbook that is uh, just thumbed through that, and it's a great resource. SCORE is a volunteer-based business, uh, vo volunteer-based business counseling service. You can, uh, if you're an established business and you just happen to be on here, or maybe you're, one of these days you can be one of the, if you're a new business, one of these days you can be a business counselor that volunteers through SCORE. But for new businesses, it's a great resource, free or low-cost counseling. Um, it's throughout the U.S., but local SCORE offices all throughout Tennessee. Um, check out their website. They have a lot of online workshops and online webinars you can view videos of. The Startup Roadmap uh, listed on here specifically. And simple steps to exiting your business. If you're a new business right now, you don't even want to think about that, right? But all things must come to an end. Correct, right. Okay, so I want to show you on our website uh, a resource we have about closing your business here in just a minute. The Small Business Administration has a ton of resources. <clears throat> that you can go there as well. There's their website, sba.gov. Any business in Tennessee needs to follow us if you're on social media, either our Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. I believe now we have um, another one. I can't remember what it is. There's another LinkedIn. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we recommend doing this because this is where we will put out any big important information. It's, it's not a spam type of account, but if we have you know, we're not putting stuff out all the time. It's important stuff that we will put out there if there's a new law change, if there's um, a webinar coming up, a resource that we're wanting to share with you, important notices, that kind of things, that those kind of things, you want to follow us for that. 
All right, so I'm going to stop here for a second. I'm going to go over to our website and I'm also going to go ahead and open up the chat because we'll have after I show you all some places on our website, we'll have some time. Katie, can you repeat everything you just said? <laughs> That's funny, Billy. That's a lot. It is a right? lot, isn't it? It is a lot. Okay, so chat is open now. Um, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep yapping and maybe hopefully not boring you all to death, but I'm going to take you over to I'm going to go on a little field trip. And as I'm going through this uh, through our website, Billy and Liz and Dan, if y'all see any questions in there that are something that, that are things I can show them over on our website, um, let me know. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and just take y'all on a brief tour. This is our homepage. We've shown you how to get to 10 tap. We've shown you how to get over to revenue help. We've shown you how to go to the individual tax pages. We've shown you our uh, taxpayer education. That's where the webinars are and the, where you register for this. Here is the site for businesses. This is the site that Liz was talking about at the very beginning, eons ago now it seems like, right? Uh, for new businesses. This is where all that information about getting set up properly was including the the printable worksheet that's like the checklist um, that's where all of that stuff is um, another very important place i want to take you to from our, back to our home page here we've talked a lot about our tax manuals you can get to an individual taxes manual from going to their taxes page right we showed you that with the business tax but i want to show you where they all are i know tax resources there's also a tile down there for it but we're going to go to tax resources and then from here um several different links but tax guidance is where i'm going to click guidance and then lots of different things you hear is where you've got a link over to the the law book uh, the online law book and revenue rules this is where we're going to go in just a second the manuals this is this is the mecca here of, of tax information rulings important notices other stuff here uh but let's let's drill down to this tax manager you can see here we have been busy over the last few years um our policy and audit uh, basically an all hands on deck to put together these exhaustive tax manuals that quite frankly we use internally all the time they are they have so much great information they're written in very clear understandable language you can search them um, you can see prior versions i clicked on business tax here for example you can see here's the manual it was updated in june i'll click on it in a second but you can see prior versions in case you're looking at filing an old return for a tax year and you're wondering wait did something change but seems like it used to be this might be a good time to look up a prior version but when i click on the manual you can see it's a pdf if you didn't know this already if you could if you click Control f you can search um, any title and it'll show you contractor um just for example here all the different 151 times where we've used that that word here in this manual so uh but you can click on here's the table of contents um, they're all organized very clearly um, if you have a tax, if you are a business that has a tax account, I want to say in all of your spare time, right? Because you're not busy at all running a new business. In all your spare time, check out these manuals um, just so you can have a good understanding of at least what information is there and how it's organized. Um, let's see here. One thing we, we've talked about, I'm going to go to the top. Let me just go click on Department of Revenue. So we're back at our homepage here. We've talked a little bit about closing out your business and how to close it out properly. That it's a little bit different for different tax types. There's some general rules to closing out your businesses, but a great resource here is under the how do I, you've got some quick links here to several uh, kind of popular. These are, I would say probably the top, however many this is, 10 or 12 things that we get calls about all the time. But uh, at the bottom of this list is close a business. And this is a great resource um, for you all in one spot, what you're going to need to do. And it breaks down some, some common tax types and what you'd need to do to close out your business for each one. Again, always feel free to call us. I saw or email us. I saw someone put in the chat. I'm just not sure if I've got everything set up right. Is the best thing to do to call you and I'm thinking actually yeah we we love don't do it on April 15th as Billy said earlier uh, now no time like the present for making sure you are all set up straight if we see here uh, we'll, we'll help you get logged into TenTap if you're not already we'll make sure that you have access to everything you need if you have questions about tax law to, to, to know if you're charging the right uh, 
tax on the right products or whatever it is, uh, when in doubt, definitely just give us a call. I'm going to go back up and to the top. I've shown you in a, in a heartbeat here everywhere. And again, just like with Tintac, click through our page and see what all is there. But my favorite places to go are the individual tax pages about each tax type, the manuals, the tax manuals, and then revenue help. And of course, because I have a special place in my heart for these webinars, I would say a great resource is our webinar video library for sure. Um, in the footer, we've already shown you that's where the contact us information is. That's information about where our offices are located, how, all the different phone numbers for different things. Um, so all in one place there, the contact us page. So hey, should I stay here on the website, Billy? I'm sorry? Should I, do you want me to stay on the website? I'm not looking at chat. Uh, have you seen anything that, where you want me to take it? Oh, there's a thousand on? questions in chat. Okay. But I need to address one that uh, several people have had. For, okay. Going back to franchise and excise taxes on extensions, okay? So it's mentioned on one of the slides briefly that we'll honor a federal extension, right? That's true. We will honor a federal extension. But as it says in the Fed, uh, franchise and excise manual on page 94, let me read this to folks. If, the ta if a taxpayer who makes a timely extension request does not meet the extension payment requirements, remember the 90% and the 100% and the stuff we talked about, or if they don't file the return by the extended due date, penalties and interest will be calculated as though no extension has been granted. So that reiterates something I maybe I brought up earlier. You've got to pay on time, okay? Even if you have a federal extension, yeah, we'll honor it. In other words, you don't have to file a paper extension form with us as long as you've got the federal. But if you don't make that, that payment requirement, then tag your it. Okay. So um, so anyway, that's, that's that. I just wanted to make sure we pointed that out there too. So filing an extension, yes, yeah, starts on page 93 of our manual um, for more information about that. Picture right there, filing an extension. Right. See, we love our manuals. Uh, oh, when Tara asked the magic question, oh, this is my favorite one. Is the federal extension honored for business tax? No, it is not. We get that question by the dozens every year. The reason for it is that there's just not a statute in state law that allows for it. There is not a true extension for a business tax return. Uh, other than outside of our general statutes, which let us work with taxpayers who have had uh, traumatic events. Case in point, you can't file your sales tax return this month on time because your business caught on fire. Guess what? You let us know that and we're going to work with you to make sure that we can try to help you along in that situation. And that would be the same for any extenuating circumstances that a business might have with weather related things or, you know, you know, traumatic things and, and that. But generally, there's not a business tax extension. OK. And uh, going back to the interest rate thing, Katie, I think somebody mentioned that the current interest rate is um, actually a little higher than what you had said before. Um, is it? Maybe, we can, maybe we can go back and look at that, and it may be that that particular article is not updated properly. Um, so let, we can take a look at that here in just a second, if you'd like. Okay. But yeah, um, like it was updated on in 22, it says, so. Oh, well, then Wait, it on. probably needs to be updated now, because this is 23. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we'll probably Thank need to you. work on that. Thank you. We need to work on to that one, don't we? Yes. Hang on a second, and I'll try to look up something too, just to confirm. Sort of boring. Do, 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 do. Yes, uh, Katie. Um, yeah, if you uh, if you type in the interest rate in the top search box there, and under search revenue. And you will see a page come up that says that the current rate is 12.25%. And then 13, you have yeah, top link right there. That's it. Boom. There you go. Okay. Thanks. Who gets credit? Jesse. Jesse, 100 extra points added Thank to you, your Jesse. evaluation. 
We're hiring, Jesse, if you need a job. Jesse, come on, put in a job application, bud. Well, we're ready, okay? <laughs> we need the I help. Need to, I need to make a note to have our website changed for that. Yes, article. please do. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. Yeah. Have that done immediately. Okay. Yes, boss. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so looking at um, some of these other questions here, um, manufacturers for business tax, we're a manufacturer and exempt from business tax. Should we register for a business tax account? Nope, not at all. Please don't. No reason to. That's easy, Dave. Good job. But yeah, that, that's a slam dunk right there <laughs> for you. Um, Someone, Amber, asked an interesting question. We get this one every once in a while. I have a question about sales and use tax and the way it rounds up to the nearest dollar. Um, why is it that we're being charged as this is st as stipulated? Um, Amber, quick question, quick answer to uh, your question is that that is a generally accepted principle uh, in business as it relates to this because sometimes that works to taxpayers' favor, sometimes it does not. Uh, there's not really a suggestion to offset it. And I don't want to discount what you're asking, but that's the way the system is designed. So we do round up uh, 50 cents and up and round down uh, 49 cents and down. So you're talking um, about when filing and paying, not when charging. Correct. Sales correct, tax, right? correct. Right. And uh, I do know that sometimes um, the they do add up a little bit. Sometimes it could be to a taxpayer's advantage. Sometimes it could not. But um, there's not a real great answer other than that is the way that the system is designed. Um, Worst case yeah. scenario, they are doing the quick math is if you happen to fall right at 51 something, something blah, 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 and 51 cents, 12 months out of the year, you're going to pay an extra maybe up to $6 is the way that yeah. could Wind yeah. up, but. A couple of requests about an F and E, an actual franchise and excise uh, webinar. Uh, okay. We do not, we do not have one per se just for that. Um, we have many webinars on different parts of franchise and excise mm -hmm. tax. Um, that's something that we can work on. We have a F and E basics webinar. I'm going to show. Let's show like fifty. Or hold on. Show 50. I was hoping that would expand that. I've um, alphabetized the categories of our webinars by, by tax type here. And you can see for F&E, um, sorry, information about the affordable housing, asset backed, secure. I mean, so many webinars. Some of these are, are before my time, before I got here. But you can see how many individual fonts. That's a big one. Um, how many individual right. we're still looking at the franchise and excise webinars here see still in it all these individual this is the one i was talking about f and e basics um that's kind of an overview a little bit more information yeah. than what we went over and today I, and i think the person that was asking it was probably asking for something maybe that had a little more meat in it mm -hmm. on that so so we might want to look at that uh so thank you for the suggestion how about that um, yeah for sure if we if we do that, that will be a very long um, webinar. It would be. We have been talking recently, uh, last week's webinar, about the business tax law changes as part of Tennessee Works Act. We had several people request that we have a webinar specifically about the F&E law changes that happened just very recently. So we haven't yet planned out our next quarter, so starting in in January of 24, but we're, we love your suggestions for webinar ideas. And as a matter of fact, when you leave this webinar here in a few minutes, there is going to be a survey, basically just two, two or three questions. Did you, did you learn something new, something like that? Do you need CPE credit is another one of the questions. So if you do, that's where you answer that. And then it says, do you have any suggestion feedback for us or suggestions for future webinars? That's where we get, um, I don't think we could ever run out of topics, but we especially love to hear mm -hmm. from you what you yeah. want. If you would please about. write those, write the, that in in your response, that will give us a reminder. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if we see several of these, then that will be very helpful. Yeah, when we first started doing the webinars, Billy, I remember thinking, 
I'm just gonna run out of topics. We're gonna. I don't think it could ever happen. No. Either to, either no. either topics are updated, or there's just more and more. There's technology changes. There's industry trends and certain interests. So we we could never run out. But we certainly love your your feedback on what you want to hear about. We certainly do. I can't see the chat while I'm hanging out on here on the website, but I'm hanging out here in case there's somewhere where you want to point me to, Billy, uh, based on questions and where the I'm resources I'm still are. scanning here a few different things. Give me just a second. Uh, doo -doo -doo. While you're doing that, I'm going to go over to Revenue Help just to show everyone. That's where I've gone a few times to type in a, a keyword. I just wanted to show you specifically how it's laid out. Um, I'm going to click on Tintap here and you can see the general how-to videos about Tintap, login, Tintap registration payments. So just under payments alone, you've got 18 articles that are about um, just payments in Tintap. So we've got a ton. I think it it's around 100 different articles in here about Tintap. If, uh, if, we, if you have a question about Tintap, it's not in here. It probably should be. And about all the different uh, tax types here. Let's click on business tax. You can see we've got 100, does that say 74, 174? I need to put my glasses back 74. on. 74. 74 articles about business tax alone. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of this is information that you'll see in our manual, but it's just kind of given to you in a different way. Um, and again, it you can click over to all these articles when you're in the chat bot in Tintap and it can take you over for answering lots of different questions. So you're not closing out of one browser and into another or so or tab. I have a, a um, while you're looking at that there, Katie, uh, Juanita had an interesting question. Do you have a tax estimate calculator that can be used to see how much we should be saving for tax? No, we don't. And the reason for that, Juanita, is that we don't really have a way to know what that might look like for your business because your business is going to be different than the next person's business. I can tell you that business tax um, is way less than 1%. So if you put put aside 1%, you'd have way more money for business tax than you would ever need. Um, I can tell you that sales tax is maxed at 9.75% unless you have a single article. Um, so but you're collecting you put, that as you go along anyway, so just don't right, spend what right. you're collecting. <laughs> yes, exactly. So that's 10% right there if you think about that. But uh, tagging along with that line of thought, one of the smartest things I've ever seen business owners do, some of them just set up a separate account with their bank that's just tax. They just put tax money in there, okay? So they stick it aside. So if it's sales tax and they've done their calculations for the week to see what they did. They'll take the sales tax money and they'll throw it in that bank account. Then when they get ready to pay the business tax, or excuse me, the sales tax, then they will use that account number to make the payment from. And that sets the tax money aside from their regular accounts. And then that way they've always got their money stuck stuck aside for, for the future. So I think, I think that's a, an excellent question and, and maybe one way to look at that there too. Well, we are we are inching towards the end of the three hours. Seems like forever, and then it also seems like it flies by. So I'm landing here for the moment on our contact us page. We, like I said, we have thousands of questions in the chat. Um, if we didn't get around to your question, call us Monday through Friday, eight to four thirty. We really do. Liz and Billy both have talked about our call center being so fantastic. Dan is over our call center. He's the assistant director over it. You will get a person on the line unless it's April 15th, and then it might take a little while. You'll still get a person, it just might take a little longer. Um, yeah, or you just can some, email us. Just something for you to note too, it's not on the slide, but the, the number that you can call for the franchise and excise tax, because a number of you have franchise and excise questions, uh, call one of our auditors on that line, and it's 615-253-0700. Uh, zero, zero, zero. So again, 615 Two five three zero seven zero zero. Right there, Katie's got her. She's highlighting right now. So it's almost the same number as the other one. 
but uh, yeah, that'll get you directly into that area. And you can ask the these folks that talk franchise and excise taxes all day. They know more than Katie and Billy do. I'll tell you right now about that right. tax. That's for sure. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And again, if you if you call our general number, the 615-253-0600, we'll route you where you need to go. Yes, we would do that us. too. Um, we certainly would. So we're going to go ahead and say goodbye for for now. We hope you reach out to us or at least know where some some resources are now for you. And Liz, thank you for joining us today. I loved having you as our as our special guest. Oh, well, yes. Thank you for having me. It was fun. It was fun. So come see us, y'all. Call us. Do whatever. Thank you. Don't forget you. to fill out the happy survey happy on your way out. Yeah. And good luck to you with your business. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Billy. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. Bye.